all the great monuments of the past, Stonehenge is one of the most enduring and enigmatic. A mystery which appears to present more puzzles the more we attempt to discover its secrets. It stands on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, in the southern part of modern-day England, where it has endured the trials of 5,000 years. I mean, one of the, probably the most exciting things about Stonehenge is that um, why it was built, for what purpose, and exactly how, to, even to this day, um, with all the technology and the advancement of technology, we really don't know. It is a mystery. There has been a henge on the site for some 5,000 years. The present stone structure took shape some 3,000 years ago, around 1,000 BC. But the first stages of Stonehenge were created around 2,800 BC, just after the end of the Mesolithic Age, which makes Stonehenge older than the Great Pyramid at Giza. Unlike the pyramids, Stonehenge resolutely defies explanation. In the distant times when it was built, farming techniques were primitive, crops uncertain. Wild wolves roamed the woodlands, and the scattered bands of hunters lived a precarious existence. Stonehenge, in its prime, must have been an awesome sight, the single largest structure which any of its visitors would witness in their whole lives. that we've had in understanding Stonehenge has been the fact that although a very large part of it has been excavated, those excavations were not written up for a variety of reasons. So a great deal of the information that has come out about Stonehenge has been based really on very little archaeological fact. That gives us some facts on which we can base various ideas and various thoughts, but it will only take us so far because we can only look at the physical remains and as archaeologists and scientists we try to work out what has happened from those physical remains. It's for anybody and everybody to decide what those remains actually represent in terms of how people felt, what they were doing there, how they thought about things. We can't get that information from the archaeology. Despite the very best efforts of some of the best brains in the world of archaeology, it stubbornly declines to fit any of the theories advanced and remains as unexplained today as it did when it first entered the realms of folklore. In one of the earliest written records of Stonehenge, recorded in the 12th century, Henry of Huntington named it, even then, as one of the wonders of Britain. This contemporary print depicts the legend that the stones had been magically transported to Salisbury Plain by the great magician Merlin. Stone circles as um, uh, an enduring feature of the British landscape have always attracted myths and legends. And there are a great many different theories about what they were there for, who built them even. And of course the myth that Merlin built Stonehenge by um, transporting huge rocks across from Ireland and so on. They are magical places and they're very mysterious and some of them quite wonderful. The powers of magic are no longer the favoured explanation, but Stonehenge is a mystery that may never be solved. Older than the Great Pyramid at Giza, Stonehenge marks time as an object of wonder and almost natural beauty. 150 generations of people have regarded it with awe and admiration. It marks the beginning of a natural heritage. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. 
Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The wonder of Stonehenge has always drawn the crowds, but it is now a victim of its own immense popularity. Today, the Stonehenge site is encroached by modern roads and fenced off from the general public. English Heritage wants eventually to return Stonehenge to its dignity and isolation and it would be wonderful if one day Stonehenge was here without the roads and that you could walk to the stones, you could follow the processional avenue and perhaps then people will formulate even more of their own opinions. Stonehenge is at the centre of an extraordinary concentration of Neolithic monuments found in southern Britain and it may have been the center of intense ritual activity for at least 2,000 years. Since the time of Henry of Huntingdon, dozens of alternative theories have been advanced, involving Belgae, Phoenicians, Danes, Romans, Greeks, Egyptians, and Druids. However, very little information about its builders has come from Stonehenge itself. Some tools, some broken pots, and some burnt bone are all that have been recovered. These few unspectacular relics are now housed in the museum at Salisbury. It is very little evidence upon which to build a picture of a whole society, but in popular imagination, Stonehenge will always be associated with lurid tales of druids and speculative descriptions of all kinds of fanciful rituals involving human sacrifice. But there is no tangible evidence to link Stonehenge to such practices. However, these colourful and graphic tales have always gripped popular imagination. The association of stone circles, and particularly Stonehenge, with the Druids is really down to two people. The antiquarians um, John Aubrey and his successor, the Reverend Dr William Stukeley. Of the two, John Aubrey is uh, by far the more respectable antiquarian, an early archaeologist, a very close observer of um, stone monuments um, and an early enthusiast. But one of the things he said, and it's almost an offhand comment, has come down and almost haunted archaeologists ever since. And this was a description of Stonehenge as what he considered to be um, a great church or cathedral of the Druids or the ancient Britons. From the evidence of the cremated human bones found on the site, it has been suggested that Stonehenge was a huge burial ground. But despite numerous archaeological digs, only one complete set of human remains have been discovered on the site. But the skeleton of the man discovered at Stonehenge did reveal that at least one violent act had indeed taken place. For there, embedded in the skeleton, were the remains of the three arrowheads which had been fired into his body. The most famous burial that we have from Stonehenge is the, the so-called archer, who is lying in the ditch. Um, he is... He goes with the earliest stone monument, is an easy way of putting it. He is of the same date and he was killed by being shot with arrows, uh, some of which got him in the back and some of which got him in the front. Whether he was a sacrificial victim, whether he was mugged and thrown in the ditch, we really have no way of knowing. Uh, it's, it's a very nice scenario to suggest that he was a human sacrifice, particularly because he happens to be close to, if you like, the entrance to the monument, but we don't know. The bones of the murdered man of Stonehenge are now housed in the museum at Salisbury, and they remain the only significant find of its type. In spite of the presence of at least 460 barrows, or burial mounds, in the immediate area, it would appear that Stonehenge was not developed as a cemetery, at least as far as excavation has so far proved. Besides the burial ground theory, a huge variety of other ideas have been offered, some stranger than others. But Stonehenge has yet to be proved to have been a king's palace, a battle ring, a place for sport and pleasure, or the site of an alien landing. 
there are all sorts of different theories, none of which we can particularly uh, prove. Um, we are able to, to some extent, to, to disprove, in as much that we're fairly certain it was never used for sport, for example. The most widely accepted current theory is that it was an astronomical computer used to chart the passing of the seasons. A whole host of bewildering explanations have been offered for this, usually revolving around the fact that the monument aligns with midsummer sunrise and midwinter sunset. Beyond that, despite the great number of theories, the flimsy evidence for alignments of lunar and solar eclipses grows more and more suspect. Well, there's no doubt that there is an astronomical alignment to do with the sunrises and the sunsets at the solstices. But people who have worked on this in recent years have not been able to find any other true astronomical alignment or configuration that they, we can definitely say has any bearing on Stonehenge itself. It is estimated that Stonehenge was in use for more than 1,500 years. Then it fell into ruin and became the enigma we see today. It has descended into oblivion, a relic whose real purpose is long forgotten, an enduring reminder of the unforgiving march of time. There are over 900 surviving stone circles in the British Isles. This is Avebury, which is situated near to Stonehenge. Others are further afield, such as these stones at Castlebury in the Lake District. Callanish, which lies on the Isle of Lewis in the Hebrides. Stonehenge itself is not only the biggest Neolithic structure in Britain, it is also the largest and most complete megalithic monument in Europe. The surviving stones of Stonehenge can today be conveniently classified into three main types. The blue stones, these are the smaller stones near the camera. The larger stones which loom up behind them are the famous sarsen stones. The blue stones comprise the stones of the original bluestone circle and bluestone horseshoe and are the oldest stones at Stonehenge. Most of these are indeed blue-grey in colour, especially when wet. The sarsen circle of uprights with their lintels framed the great circle of the completed structure. The sarsen trilithon horseshoe, originally composed of five groups of three stones arranged in a horseshoe shape, this would have been the most striking feature of Stonehenge. Nowadays, we take the ability to move huge weights for granted. Stones are ripped from the ground by machines, transported by ship or lorry, and delivered right to the door of the customer. Every intermediate stage is helped by cranes and other heavy lifting machines. But the people who made Stonehenge possessed only very primitive technology. Some of the sarsen stone used to make Stonehenge was fairly local, but the blue stone did not occur within 200 miles of Stonehenge. 
The question which had puzzled researchers up until this century was, where did the blue stones come from? The blue stones come from the Priscelli Mountains in South Wales. That may seem a very strange place for them to have come from, and it may seem sort of weird and wonderful that they've come that distance to Stonehenge. But we know that there were contacts between the people who lived in the Stonehenge area and those people who were living in South Wales at possibly from as early as 3500 BC. And we know that because stone objects that were produced in one area are found in another area of where the stone doesn't exist naturally. The question of transporting these heavy stones from the area where they occur naturally to their present locality on Salisbury Plain is still a matter of debate. Some 80 blue stones weighing up to seven tons each would have been required for the double blue stone circle of Stonehenge phase two. If they were moved by human endeavor all the way from Wales, this meant a minimum journey of about 240 miles this was something of a puzzle, because it was not necessary for the Stonehenge builders to travel to Wales for supplies of durable stone. Large outcrops of equally suitable building stone were available less than 20 miles away. We know that the smaller stones, the blue stones, came from the Priscelli Mountains and that uh, certainly when you touch them versus the larger stones, the, the sarsen stones, the smaller blue stones are warm to touch, even on a cold day. So whether or not, uh, as, as rumour has it or as legend has it, that the, the people that built Stonehenge um, thought they were magical, um, we don't really know. The theory has been advanced that these stones were deposited close to the site of Stonehenge by glaciation, but there is no clear evidence of other glacially derived material in the Salisbury Plain area. In view of this, it is accepted that the blue stones must have been moved from Wales to their present setting by human effort. The most likely of the possible routes for the transport of the blue stones was overland from Priscelli to Milford Haven on the coast. Then they were taken by some sort of craft around the coast of South Wales and across the mouth of the Severn to the Bristol Avon. From there they travelled along the River Froome, then overland for six miles to the River Wiley at Warminster. Finally they joined the Avon at Salisbury and they took the stones two miles overland to Stonehenge. All this, of course, took place before the widespread adoption of the wheel. The distance on land by this route is about 24 miles, over which the stones would probably have been drawn by sledge. It was then a further 216 miles by water. The blue stones individually are not that big and it's quite likely, in fact, it's almost certain that if they were brought from the Priscelli Mountains, as we think, that they were brought by sea rather than by land. On a raft of some sort, we, we know that people at that time were perfectly capable of seafaring and the waters around southern, the southern coast of England are not too difficult. The other stones at Stonehenge, and visually the most striking, are the huge sarsen standing stones. This type of sandstone can be found scattered unevenly over the greater part of the Wessex region, with a concentration on the Marlborough Downs, about 20 miles to the north of Stonehenge. Despite the shorter distance, the task of transporting more than 80 of these enormous boulders from the Marlborough Downs was undoubtedly more difficult than the removal of the blue stones from Priscelli. It has been estimated that the task of preparing and shaping the sarsens preparing haulage equipment and transporting them to Stonehenge may well have taken years. It is obvious that stones of a particular size would have been sought after, and this undoubtedly involved splitting larger boulders to preset requirements. In this respect, an additional attraction of the Sarsons may have been their tendency to occur naturally in tabular blocks. Any reduction in size would have been accomplished by applying hot and cold stresses to the brake line and by driving wooden wedges into the cracks. Minor quarrying, shaping and dressing was achieved by pounding the stone using very hard sarsen mauls. While the masons were putting the finishing touches to each stone and it was nearly ready to be raised, 
workmen began preparing a socket in the ground. Finally, ropes tied around the stone's head were passed over an A-frame and harnessed to oxen or men who needed to haul the stone into a vertical position. The final position could be adjusted with packing stones hammered in all around the base of the stone until it was exactly vertical. It is in itself a huge feat of engineering and without the use of, of slide rules and computers, the precision with which it was built was quite amazing. So whoever um, was organising the building of it was very structured in, in their own format. They, they obviously had quite a, a culture and were very aware of the needs for uh, perfection, I suppose. Then came the most astonishing achievement, the raising of the lintels. Without pulleys and cranes, it is almost inconceivable that the lintels could be placed onto the tops of the stones with such mathematical precision. As we can see, the top of each standing stone was crafted to include a semicircular raised tenon designed to fit snugly into an aperture known as a mortise, carved into the underside of the lintel. Obviously, with the primitive measuring techniques available, mistakes were made. This lintel, which has fallen down, has two mortise holes carved into it. One was in the wrong place, causing the builders to have to make a second on the other side. Raising the lintel was also a puzzle. The most likely solution was that the lintel was eased into place on a timber crib at ground level, a metre from the uprights. A long wooden lever was used to raise the lintel and a chock of timber was pushed underneath. The process slowly continued until the crib was elevated into a tower, with the lintel raised to the same level as the tops of the uprights. When all this was ready, the lintel was levered sideways until it was perched securely. The thing about Stonehenge is that it's the biggest and the best. But the actual, if you break it down into its individual elements, most of those elements occur elsewhere, and sometimes in quite profusion. There are a lot of monuments that are similar to the different bits of Stonehenge. Where Stonehenge differs from everything else is that the final phase of it was in stone. The mathematical and astronomical abilities of the Neolithic people are hotly debated. It is not possible to infer from the evidence of archaeology alone that prehistoric man in Britain had an interest in science and knowledge for its own sake. There is no clear evidence that his concern with the heavens was either scientific or metaphysical. Almost certainly, interest in astronomy was connected with practical considerations, insofar as it might control the smooth running of the farming calendar. Now, it has been said that stone circles were probably calendars for agricultural purposes, but it's been pointed out that um, any farmer that relied on um, observations from the stone circles um, probably wouldn't be very successful because um, in many ways the readings, the astronomical readings that you can take from the stone circles are hopelessly inaccurate. But that is not to say that the stone circles themselves didn't form a part in the process of calendar making. And the establishment of a calendar was extremely important for a culture, for cultural purposes. Uh, it told the cycle of the seasons in a broad sense. But also, the, um, the calendar itself often embodied ideas of, um, of birth, growth, death, decay, which is the, the very heart of all the world's major religions. The observation of the midsummer and midwinter solstice would probably have enjoyed some religious or ceremonial significance. The shortest day of the year was important to the agricultural communities. As the hours of daylight increased, the certainty came that the seasons were going to follow their natural order. Spring would come after winter, crops would grow, and life would go on as before. Well, the, the site is certainly significant. What we don't know is why it is significant. It was certainly significant and very important to the people who built it. What we do know is that the midsummer uh, alignment of the summer sun um, has some significance. To what extent and what significance that is, we don't really know. If it was a heavenly observatory, Stonehenge was not a particularly accurate one. 
the supposed alignments of sun and moon have been interpreted in many different ways, none of which justify the creation of such a complex structure. In its day, the building of Stonehenge was clearly a massive task. The impetus for such a drive is unknown, but it must have required the involvement of large sections of society. The scale of the project suggests an elite clearly existed that could give orders and see them carried out. We don't know exactly who built Stonehenge, uh, but we do know that it had to have been built to a large extent by people living in the area. How precisely it was built in terms of who the labour force was, we, we cannot know, there's no way of knowing. Uh, it's quite possible that slave labour was used, but archaeologically the, the, we could not find any evidence for that. I think it's equally possible that it was a great honour to be involved in building Stonehenge. It seems the scope of Neolithic technology was startlingly ambitious. And the more we learn about it from detailed studies of the tools and reconstructions of the way they were used, the more impressive it is that so much could have been achieved with so few tools made from just flint, stone and bone. What is truly awe-inspiring, though, is the vast amount of time that many of the techniques required. But the roots of Stonehenge could be traced back to the end of the last Ice Age, about 10,000 BC. Ice Age man had lived a nomadic existence and hunted all his days. These nomads followed the herds to their successive grazing grounds, never settling in one place. But as the ice retreated, it became possible to set down roots, to capture stock and breed domestic animals for food and produce, and to develop primitive agriculture, sowing and reaping, and eventually storing his own food supply. These changes took place over a long span of time, some 6,000 years to approximately 4,000 BC, about the end of the Mesolithic Age. During this period, the semi-nomads were also making tools for cutting and shaping timber. These earliest tools were made of flint and stone, and a trade in them grew, with established routes over hundreds of miles. Mesolithic man was also becoming a builder, and the first permanent settlements were beginning to take root. The earliest Neolithic settlers in Britain have been called the Windmill Hill People, simply because their main archaeological remains have been found at a 21-acre causewayed site of the same name. It is located not far from Stonehenge. This site has yielded artefacts and information about the primitive society just before the construction of Stonehenge. The enclosures of the Windmill Hill people, with their banks, ditches and gaps, were probably not used for penning livestock or as habitation settlements. It appears they were used for ritual or ceremonial purposes. It was structures like these which were the ancestors of Stonehenge. Looking at Stonehenge today, what we're actually looking at is the end product of something like 1,500 years of monument building. We see the ruins of the very last monument that was built at Stonehenge, and in fact it's a whole series of monuments, one inside the other. The first monument that was built there was a simple ditch with a bank on the inside of it. And the people who built that bank and ditch were just the normal, everyday people who lived in and around the Stonehenge area. And it's not the only monument of its type in the country. There are lots and lots and lots of circular monuments with banks and ditches all over the country. And it's something that would have been going on for already a thousand years before any monument was built at Stonehenge. In the beginning, the Stonehenge site was a simple circular earthwork, or henge, an open space bordered by a chalk bank and large enough to hold several hundred people. For a thousand years, this earthwork continued to be a meeting place of native farmers. It was then altered by the digging out of a circle of 56 pits just within the bank. These pits are now known as the Aubrey Holes, after the 17th century antiquarian John Aubrey. The Aubrey Holes were 
part of a structure which was the very first at Stonehenge. It was a wooden structure. We know that there were wooden posts there. We don't exactly know how those posts related to each other. Again, we have theories. This, we believe, was one of the earlier phases and um, represents sort of one of the many phases of Stonehenge. This Stonehenge phase one was probably completed around 2800 BC but it was to be nearly 600 years before the familiar outline of Stonehenge as we know it today would take shape. In the intervening years, phase two was created. It saw the entrance slightly realigned so that from the center it faced approximately towards midsummer sunrise and in the opposite direction to the midwinter sunset. An avenue of two parallel banks with external ditches was laid out for about 530 metres towards Stonehenge Bottom. Four small stones known as the Station Stones were set up on the inner edge of the ditch, two of them enclosed by small ditches of their own. It would appear that, at this stage, it was decided to erect a double circle of blue stones in the centre. About three-quarters of the circle was set up but a change of plan seems to have brought the work to a sudden stop. The stones were cleared away and the holes refilled. This took place about 2045 BC, at the beginning of the Bronze Age. The circular monuments that we have belonging to the Neolithic period, um, and they begin about 3500 BC and they, they go along for 1500 years or so, they seem to have almost been like, um, one could say sort of like regional fairs that we tend to find artefacts in them which have come from a wider area than you would expect. They're certainly communal monuments in the sense that they seem to be a place where people came together to do things, and it may have been people from a wide area. It is generally accepted that the steady growth in population from the end of the Ice Age allowed a higher degree of organisation, which made the building of Stonehenge possible. precision of much of the stonework is notable, and some reasonably sophisticated measuring techniques must have been perfected. Since most traces of the people who made Stonehenge have long gone, succeeding generations have speculated endlessly about the purpose of monuments like this and the identity of the builders. With the arrival of phase three, the great sarsen stones were transported from the Marlborough Downs and set in an outer ring of 30 uprights. Inside, it had a horseshoe of five trilithons, all crowned with sarsen lintels. In phase 3b, around 1540 BC, an oval of blue stones was arranged inside the five trilithons, and two rings of holes were dug probably to hold the remaining bluestones. However, this project was abandoned and the bluestones were rearranged in the horseshoe and circle setting, which partially survives today. One final event, phase four, was the extension of the avenue from Stonehenge Bottom to the River Avon at West Amesbury making its entire length one and a half miles. This phase was completed around 1075 BC. Stonehenge is undoubtedly one of the most magnificent monuments in Europe, if not the world. And I think it's very easy to be overawed by it. And I think it's very easy for us to look at it and think, this has to have been something utterly splendid. I think in its final form, with all the stones in position and everything, it must have been the most incredible thing. It still is. But the problem we have, I think, is that we tend to project our own ideas onto the people who built it. And ultimately, we don't know why it was built. But we do know that it was a very long process building it. So whatever the significance of the site in the first place, it was dead important. 
for a very long period of time, and it persisted to be important over something like 1,500 years, which is an enormous amount of time. We simply do not know enough about the nature of Neolithic society. Until the present century, the popular view of Stonehenge was still coloured by lurid tales of druids and sacrifice. Neolithic Britons were characterised as savage and barbaric. The elaborate monument on Salisbury Plain was used as evidence of a wild society populated by druids and warriors. The great number of axes and earthenware from the period were interpreted as signs of warlike tendencies and human sacrifice was taken for granted. The modern view from our own less religious age is that it was constructed before the time of the druids. The consensus is firmly in favour of the theory that it was a huge astronomical observatory. But this view does not adequately explain the scale of Stonehenge and the complexity of the design. If you place yourself in the position of the early peoples who might have built them and try to imagine what it would have been like seeing the heavens rotating around, of course for them the movement of the stars, the movement of the sun and the moon and so on was terribly important. They needed to know of the cycles of the seasons in order to know when to plant and so on and so forth. Debate about the origins and uses of Stonehenge is not new. In 1655, the architect Inigo Jones published a book, Stonehenge Restored, following acrimonious debates about the connections between the mysterious stones, Merlin, the Druids and the Romans. What is certain is that at some time after 1000 BC, Stonehenge was savagely damaged. The destruction of Stonehenge can be convincingly argued as the work of man or the work of nature, or more probably, both. Some scholars believe that natural processes are mainly to blame. In modern times, some of the stones have fallen down unaided as they have become unsafe, and this suggests that time and weather may be enough to explain the damage to the monument. In support of this idea, much of the damage seems to be on the southwest side, the side that bears the brunt of the severe weather. Gusting gale force winds from the southwest could have rocked the uprights in their sockets and dislodged the lintels. Whatever effect the weather has had in dislodging the stones, pillaging has been a major factor. Some stones may have been collected after they fell as a result of natural processes. Others have clearly been rooted out, and with some force. The broken blue stones provide evidence of this. We should not overlook the possibility that Stonehenge was never completed, and that the remains represent the furthest point to which the structure was advanced. The ruins that we see at Stonehenge were not the last monument that was going to be built on the site. There was going to be at least one other. Around the stones, there are two circles of holes. You can't see them now because they're, they're filled in. And they appear to have been dug to hold stones of about the size of the blue stones. But we can tell from the bottoms of them, that no stones were ever placed in there. And we know, really, that this was an unfinished monument. In the present day, some modern repairs have been effected using the concrete which can clearly be seen here. This obvious blend of old and new is a deliberate policy on the part of English heritage, designed to clearly differentiate the original from the modern repair. The images and metaphors that supposedly made up the prehistoric mythology and religion that surrounded Stonehenge have left an enduring legacy, a fertile hunting ground for artists and illustrators. We can only speculate on this temple of the sun god, the earth goddess, and who knows what are the deities of the moon and sky. But there has been no shortage of artists ready to fill in the gaps. 
Most famous of all is Turner's atmospheric evocation of the elements at Stonehenge. By the 18th century, Stonehenge was already a tourist attraction. The mystery of the great stones rising out of Salisbury Plain lured visitors to count the tumbled pillars, to chip bits off them, and to speculate about their origin. Maybe it was for something to do with worship and something to do with um, uh, the sun and the moon. Was it an event that was perhaps um, started or, or pushed by other beings. I think it was worship the sun or something, worship any kind of gods or something, yeah. You know, it's just, it's beautiful and maybe they just wanted to leave something for other people to see. I don't know, I think it was a, a religious symbol probably, um, worship the sun and so on. I've heard the, the legends about, you know, anything from aliens did it to, you know, it being a, a temple to the gods or whatever. It's kind of easy to say that they've had help from like extraterrestrials <laughs> but um, it's it's a, it's definitely a mystery I mean that's that goes without saying the volume of visitors in recent years has grown to such an extent it was obvious something had to be done to protect what was left of the finest megalithic monument in Europe In March 1978, after much careful deliberation, a fence was erected. The streams of visitors to Stonehenge find very little in the way of explanation when they arrive there, and many naturally assume that it is all a matter of speculation and imagination. Whatever importance was placed on it centuries ago, that importance is still there. And in a way, I suppose, the nice thing about it is, is that it means different things to different people. The same is true today. Some would see it as a monument to the victims of prehistoric battles. To others, it is an astronomical calculator, or a temple as alive today as when it was built. For many, though, the constant function of Stonehenge is a magnet, attracting both interest and speculation. Why Stonehenge became the ultimate, if you like, in terms of prehistoric monuments, I don't think we can ever be entirely sure. But it has something to do with that area being special. And I actually think one of the possible explanations for it is actually fairly mundane, which is that it was the breadbasket of England at the time. It was an extremely rich area for agriculture. Now, how it came to be that, I don't know. But in terms of the technology that was available, the way people were living, it's very likely to me that the most important reason was the fact that it was just such a good area for growing food. Antiquarians, artists and present archaeologists have all combined to contribute to a rich written and visual record of a unique monument. This is the strange and challenging story of Stonehenge, the continuing enigma, a thing of beauty that continues to delight without striving to inform. For the ancient Romans, Hadrian's Wall marked the very edge of the civilized world. In the winter, the wind whips in from the north with snow in its teeth. This was obviously not going to be the favorite posting for a Mediterranean soldier. To cap it all, hostile tribes were never far away. But here, they had to stand the last outpost which covered the whole of the known world. Imagine a snake 73 miles long, 10 feet wide, 
20 feet high, built from millions of tons of stone and turf, twisting and turning over the landscape from sea to sea. This is where the Romans drew a line as if to say this far and no further, creating a division across an entire country. This is the mark to show that this land is ours. Here is the end of civilization. Behind us are order, law and prosperity. Beyond this wall are only barbarians. The Romans had actually been uh, in occupation up here for nearly 40 years before Hadrian's Wall is built. They'd briefly gone into Scotland, had to send a lot of troops abroad for other activities, withdrew to more or less the same line that Hadrian's Wall was eventually built on. It was a frontier, it was a, basically a, a lateral road from coast to coast with forts every seven or eight miles along it. For a Roman soldier in a mild castle with his comrades gathered from the corners of the known world, Hadrian's Wall represented safety. The military might which had forced conquered lands to give up their men to fight wars on the other side of the world. This was the greatest of all Roman fortifications. The Roman legionaries were equipped, trained and transported by the great machinery of the legion. they faced mysterious, hostile lands, occupied by bearded and painted warriors, uncivilized cunning and deadly. We know the Great Wall across the north of Britain was ordered to be built by the Emperor Hadrian. We also know why it was built, as his biographer recalls his reasons. The Britons could no longer be held under control. Hadrian was the first to build a wall 80 miles long to separate the Romans and the barbarians. Hadrian's wall is, is the most impressive of all Roman artificial frontiers. And Hadrian himself came here and had a look and obviously set the thing in motion because the, the Romans were getting attacked by rebellious Britons at the time, there's no question about it. But I think the, the main purpose of, of it was, was a, a statement for internal consumption. Hadrian really wanted something impressive to say, this is the end, there's going to be no more expansion. Therefore, he made it as elaborate and as impressive as possible. The wall still stands today as a reminder of the power that was Rome, a monument to the vibrant and powerful empire which extended from Asia to Britain. Hadrian's decision to build a wall was undoubtedly due to the fact he knew what the countryside was like around here. He must have had reports from his surveyors and engineers. Now, he's basically going from coast to coast, uh, and he's taking advantage in the centre of the country of the great rising windsill ridge, just a little ridge, just a mile north of us. Love that, it would look totally spectacular. And undoubtedly, a certain amount of the wall is a reflection of Hadrian's personality. It's a big job. I mean, fancy building a wall nine foot six or so thick, 15, 20 feet high, ludicrous for the job it was supposed to do. Uh, but he built it because it's a symbol of himself. Today, many of these remains are strikingly well preserved as they wind over hillside, valley and crag. Standing against the rain and the cold in northern Britain, the dark stones contrast with the green of the land in the midst of some of the wildest and most spectacular scenery in the British Isles. The sheer magnitude of the operation was an amazing feat of engineering. No bulldozers or mechanical diggers were used to dig the ditches and raise the wall. There was precious little technology beyond the simple trenching tools and the strong arms of the legionaries to wield them. This expresses so well the essential flavor of Rome and all it stood for at the height of its power. Here was a confident people making the brave and bold decisions to mark a line from sea to sea with a wall. Here was an organized people with the vast reserves of manpower and money to see that it was carried out. Here were a people with an eye to history itself.
Having built it, they seemed ready to stand and guard it for over 300 years. Over a million cubic yards of stone had to be torn from the ground, transported to the site, and set in place by the hands of the legionaries. It began as a single wall, but it evolved in the building. By the time it was finished, it had become a complicated defensive system. What you've got to bear in mind about Hadrian's Wall as you see it now is that that is the final version. You know, ditch, wall, with its mile castles, turrets and forts, then a lateral road, then the Great Vallum, and then to the south of the Vallum, of course, there's the original frontier line, the road running from coast to coast with its forts every seven or eight miles along it. When the Romans landed in Britain, they moved through the countryside, constructing their crisscross network of roads, building their forts and dominating the land. The forts were mostly of a similar construction, with earth ramparts raised to surround the buildings within. These ramparts were crossed through wooden gatehouses and had watchtowers at the corners set to guard the buildings that lay inside. The layout of these buildings usually followed a set pattern. At the front, facing the enemy, were the barracks and stables for the troops stationed here. As well as common rooms for the men, there were separate rooms for the centurion and other officers. The barracks ranged down either side of a central road that led to the headquarters building. It was here, in a square building built around an open courtyard, that the day-to-day -day activities of the fort were organized. On the side of this building was a long, narrow hall with a dais at one end. This was the tribunal on which the commander stood to address his men. Behind this room were a series of smaller rooms, the central one of which was usually a shrine, and below this shrine was the fort's strong room. Alongside the headquarters building was the commander's house, another square building around an open courtyard, and to the rear were more barracks and the workshops. The bathhouse was usually found outside the fort. This was the pattern repeated all over the country. An outstanding example of a Roman bathhouse can be found on the wall itself at Chester's. Built right next to the river, a complicated system of aqueducts brought water straight up into the bathhouse. Comprehensive excavations have revealed a system of boilers, hot rooms, warm rooms, cold rooms, and even changing rooms, which paint a complete picture of the Romans' love for bathing. It was a line of forts like this that was first used to mark the northern frontier of Roman occupation in Britain. This line of forts, two of which can still be seen at Corbridge and Vindolanda, were linked by a road which we now call the Stainegate. Further south, within striking distance of the wall, were other Roman fortifications. This is Hardnock Fort in the Lake District and its construction follows the classic Roman pattern of building. On a chill winter's day, the evocative landscape still gives a glimpse of what it must have been like to be a part of the garrison in these last outposts of the empire. Like the wall and the network of forts, the Roman roads which connected them were no mean engineering feat in themselves. 
built of layers of stone upon smaller stone with a metalled and cambered surface to let the water drain into the ditches at its side, they provided the occupying troops with a quick means of getting from place to place. Forts were usually built 14 miles or so apart, as this was reckoned to be a day's march along a Roman road. By this means, the forces of occupation had both the communication structure and the power base to hold Europe. The exact reasons why Hadrian decided to replace this well-tried and tested system of forts along a road which worked in so many countries with a wall is not clear. There was a crisis, general crisis on when Hadrian became emperor. I mean, the circumstances were, were very difficult. His predecessor died on his way back from a, a disastrous campaign in the east. He was proclaimed emperor by the army he was in command of in Syria. And then there were rebellions all around, all around the frontiers, including in Britain. I mean, as far as Britain is concerned, the, 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 our source says the Britons could not be kept under Roman control. So uh, you ask the question, what, what sort of rebellion was it and where was it? I think the Vindolanda tablets have thrown some light on that. For example, there's one tablet which is obviously a report on Britons who've been conscripted into the Roman army. And they're described as the naked Britons. And they're described as the, as the Britunculi, which is a previously unknown word, obviously meaning something like nasty or pathetic little Brits. No love was lost between the Romans and these northern tribes, the Brigantes. Salgovi and Novanti. These warlike peoples living in the harsh climate of the north of Britain were never really defeated. They may have been subdued and pacified, but smouldering resentment directed at the invading Romans appears to have been quick to burst into flame. The fact that they kept a large army up here, and you're talking of many thousands of men, is to a certain extent a, a sign that they failed in what they were trying to achieve up here. Because normally, uh, by moving an army in and keeping people under control for a while, they sort of civilized those people, as they like to call it, and they then gradually withdrew their forces, as they did in Spain, as they did in parts of North Africa and so on. Here, they never succeeded. Now, that is presumably due to the, the nature of the people they were dealing with up here. A document found at Vindolanda, close to the wall, reveals how these Britons appeared to the Romans. It has been translated to read, the Britons are unprotected by armor. There are very many cavalry. The cavalry do not use swords, nor do the wretched Britons take up fixed positions in order to throw javelins. Over the years, a number of folk legends have grown up, which include mythical victories over the Romans by barbarians. One of these is the disappearance of the Ninth Legion. Rosemary Sutcliffe, the great children's author, used it as a basis for her famous story, The Eagle of the Ninth. In the book, she describes how the Ninth Legion marched out of its barracks near York in the year 117 AD to deal with an uprising amongst the Caledonians and was never heard of again. The sobering facts are rather less flattering to the barbarian tribes. Records from this time show that the 9th Legion moved from Lincoln to York when the new barracks were finished there. They did indeed then move further north to do battle with the British tribes. This was under the leadership of the then governor of Britain, Gaius Julius Agricola. He is recorded as leading a campaign to civilize the northern tribes. During the first year of this campaign, he failed to bring the Caledonians to battle. Instead, he was attacked himself. In a night attack by the tribesmen, he lost nearly one third of his army, including elements of the 9th Legion. This is probably the incident that has passed into the folklore as the legend of the Lost Legion. But, like all great myths, there is an element of truth in the tale. Discoveries over recent years have proved that the 9th Legion was actually destroyed in the line of duty, but in Syria, over 40 years later, in 161 AD. 
If a whole legion had been lost to the Caledonian tribes, it certainly would have been cause for comment. A Roman legion of that time consisted of nearly 6,000 men. As well as the legionaries, there were cavalry, auxiliaries and support troops, offering all sorts of different trades and skills to keep the army on the move. It would have been extremely rare for all these to have been in the same place at the same time. Nowadays, it's thought that the 9th Legion was probably withdrawn from Britain shortly after 155 AD. At that time, relations with the northern tribesmen and the British in general were becoming more settled. They moved to another trouble spot, through Holland and Germany, where records have been discovered, to do battle in the Middle East against the Parthians. It was during this campaign that they were indeed wiped out, a long way from the mountains, forests and valleys of northern Britain. Nevertheless, the legend of the destruction of the 9th Legion echoes down through the mists of time. Even today, people standing on or near the wall have claimed to have heard and seen the ghosts of marching Roman soldiers. The legend of the lost legionaries continues to hold the popular imagination. The general tone of popular myths like these suggests that the Romans were losing the war in this area. This was not the case, although in order to hold their own, the Romans had had to make a series of incursions into northern Britain. Hadrian seems to have simply decided that too many scarce resources were being deployed and that enough was enough. He ordered that a line had to be drawn to mark the northwestern frontier of Roman influence. It was across the wild countryside north of the Stanegate forts that the wall was built. Naturally, they chose the more defensible parts of that landscape. In the absence of a natural barrier such as a river, hilltops and ridges were ideal. It was Hadrian himself on a visit to Britain in 120 AD who ordered the wall to be built. Right from coast to coast, such a wall is built in spite of the fact that in this central sector here, there was never any threat from the north. No, no army has ever come down the center uh, in this area. It's, it's all moors and bogs and swamps up there. And the poor old soldiers actually building the wall on the top must have known this. You know, what on earth is the point of building a wall here? And the centurion will quietly say, because you're told to do it, and that's the only reason you need to know. At first, it was to have a purely military function. The original wall was to be styled on the mound and fence constructions found in Germany and on other boundaries of the Roman Empire. The age of Roman expansion had come to a halt and the time of consolidation was upon them. The wall was simply to mark this northwestern limit of the Roman Empire, to separate the Romans from the barbarians. In Germany, he had a similar sort of frontier, and these were these were the first time frontiers the Romans had up till that point, up till Hadrian. The Roman attitude was that their empire was going to go on expanding without end. So having having a frontier was 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 as 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 below their dignity as as the idea of having walls around the city of Rome. They they didn't need it. They they were invincible. Hadrian Hadrian changed this. Initially, the orders were given to build a single wall. In the east, where stone was plentiful, it was to be all stone, 10 feet wide and 20 feet high. In the west, they were building it all from, from turf because there wasn't enough limestone to make the mortar. And so to start with, they, they had a turf wall. Uh, we know this because there's one section where they slightly rejigged it when they finally came to replace it in stone, which may have been a matter of 10 years. It may have taken a bit longer. Um, uh, and they built it on a slightly different alignment. So there's one stretch in Cumberland where the, the actual turf wall, which was the first sort of temporary structure, was still there. Alongside most of the length of the wall on the northern, barbarian side, 
Except where the local landscape made it unnecessary, a ditch was to be dug. This was to be about nine feet deep and 27 feet wide. The whole length of the wall was to be peppered with fortlets and turrets. The fortlets, each with gates to the north and south, were to have accommodation for up to 32 troops and were to be built every Roman mile. Between each of these mile castles, there would be two turrets. From these, the small garrisons stationed on the wall itself, probably drawn from auxiliaries recruited into the Roman legions from the British people themselves, looked northwards into the hostile lands beyond the wall. Here they watched for signs of trouble, and if it looked like it was going to be more than they could handle, they would send urgent signals back to their fellows in the forts on the Stainegate. Reinforcements would then arrive hotfoot. It seemed like a perfect solution to the problems of this turbulent frontier, and very soon men from every British legion were hard at work on the wall. It's a common misconception that the, uh, all the rotten jobs of building on the wall are, are probably done by the natives with a few Romans in charge supervising, but that's definitely not the case. The, the native Britons would be a very unreliable labour force, and apart from anything else, they weren't used to building in stone at all. They wouldn't have known what they were doing. We've got plenty of evidence that the wall is actually built by the men, the skilled craftsmen drawn from three legions that were in Britain at the time, the 2nd Legion, the 20th and the 6th and they, they've left their building stones all the way along the wall, and we know they built it. Obviously, uh, a legionary gang is given a sector of maybe 100 yards or so of wall to build, and the centurion in charge, once it's built, normally signs his name off on a special little tablet on the wall, many of which we've found. Even before it was finished, the plans were altered. Orders went out that the main fighting force was to be moved onto the wall itself, Presumably they were being attacked or it was taking too long for the regiments to get up if there was an emergency, so they decided to put forts actually on the wall, in some cases across the wall. In the end there are a total of 17 forts which are more or less on the wall. There were one or two such as Vindolanda which were left, although it's a mile away. Uh, there are a few others which are not actually joined on physically to the wall, but um, in, in many cases they actually um, were astride the wall with, with three gateways two at the side and one, one on the north side, beyond the wall, probably for cavalry, so that cavalry could, could, could come out in strength uh, simultaneously from the three gateways. But that was what you can call the third stage, and it must have been absolutely maddening because they'd already built the wall and, and turrets and mile castles in some cases had to be demolished and then they put the fort there. It was also ordered that the wall itself should be narrowed to eight feet rather than ten and that it should be extended in stone at each end to protect the flanks, as long as they could get the limestone. Perhaps this was an indication of heightened tension or increased threats. You can still see the signs of this change of plans today. In parts, a narrow wall sits on broad foundations and there are turrets and mile castles that were built to fit into the wider wall and had to be changed to fit into the new, narrower gauge. This radical change of plan has been dated to about 124 AD. At the same time, work had begun on extra defences to the immediate south of the wall. This was the Vallum, two earth mounds rising some six feet above ground level flanking a central ditch some 10 feet deep with a total width of about 120 feet. This would have presented a formidable obstacle to any would-be attacker. They build a wall with a great ditch in front of it and they have all these mile castles and turrets along it and then uh, a few years later they decide well we've got to put the regiments absolutely on the wall too so they build these forts like house tents and they build this great earthwork to the south now, there's no conceivable reason for that except to, to, to seal off the military zone and therefore the, 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 the implication is that the natives are creeping up at night and setting fire to Roman, Roman installations, um, which, which suggests that their control over this, this area, the Pennines, was, was, not, was not absolutely 100% uh, under control. This was the southern boundary of the military area 
a sort of Roman barbed wire. As with the mild castle gates which they faced, the Vallum crossing points offered a measure of control over the north-south traffic in the region. Rules about contraband and weapons could be enforced, and more importantly, taxes could be collected. It was the customs barrier of its day. It's not built for defence. Although it's got a lot of troops stationed along it, there are more troops stationed to the north, and a lot more troops also to the south. I mean, a Roman frontier is a frontier in depth. The physical barrier, uh, well, what he does by building that is achieve something that he probably had in mind, an excellent, excellent customs line. Um, there are all sorts of gates in the wall, and whoever is going to be trading north and south has got to go through those gates, where, of course, the Roman soldiers can search them, tax them, do all sorts of things to them. But why make changes to plans hardly begun? Things were not going well in this part of the Roman world, and the natives were getting restless. They didn't like the Romans, and they didn't like their war. It was like a modern-day motorway cutting through the landscape, severing long-used footpaths and trade routes, and even cutting off fields from farmsteads. What happened after the wall is built, and was the wall, for example, successful? Did it do the job Hadrian wanted it to do? Did it quiet the natives down? Did it actually separate this lot from that lot up there? Um, the short answer is that from Roman historians, we know absolutely nothing. Um, Again, we go back to this business, they had to remain here, so presumably there was always a problem. But, the, you know, the natives on both sides weren't fools, and although there were all these gateways leading through the wall, manned, certainly, where they might be taxed and so on, um, I'm sure that a certain amount of ingenuity would be used, and they must have known of the odd corrupt Roman soldier, and they could get through his mile castle if they went at the right time. And also, of course, uh, in the ultimate resort, if they really had trouble in, along the wall, they could get into a ship and sail round it. Soon, the British on both sides of the wall were plotting and planning against the Romans and their wall. Very soon, the wall had become, for the Romans, a way to divide these allies from each other, rather than keeping the enemy at arm's length. The military purpose had changed as well. No longer the passive line of watchtowers. If there was a threat from the northern tribes, the Roman troops could mass under the excellent cover of the wall. Their enemies would be unable to see this and could not foresee where the mighty army would sally forth against them. Meanwhile, the Vallum protected their backs. Life on the wall was hard. This was no fertile region of Roman influence. There were no locals to adopt Roman ways, such as there were in the south. There was no one who was prepared to come to this dark wilderness region to build their villas and farms to share the administrative load. The garrison town and supply base at Corbridge were the sole example of urbanization. It's true that small settlements for retired legionaries and traders made a brief appearance, and civilian villages grew up under the protection of the forts. But this remained mainly a military area. Other documents found at Vindolanda give more of an insight to this. One, written on thin oak bark and dated to a day in May around AD 90, gives an account of the forces stationed at that fort. At that time, there were 751 men led by six centurions assigned to the fort, although 470 were not actually there. They were absent on other duties. Some were collecting the pay, others were in London, and some 300 and their centurion were at Corbridge. This was likely to be a group of new British recruits undergoing their basic training before taking their place in patrolling the war. The 
There was a further small group of 46 or so with the legate, the region's chief administrator, who was either in York or London at the time. That left only 270 or so actually holding the fort in case of local hostilities. But they were lucky. The same piece of oak records that there were only 30 on the sick list, and only some of these were suffering from wounds. This seems to point to minor local skirmishes rather than a major pitched battle in the area. Life in the forts was routine. After a breakfast of porridge, bread and fruit, the normal day would be taken up with duties around the fort. Physical fitness and weapons training were important to keep the troops in tip-top condition. And there were jobs around the fort itself that had to be done. Supplies of food and building materials had to be gathered. The workshops had to be manned. And there are even records of legionaries being detailed to clean the armor of the commanding officer. Guard duties were not confined to the fort, but covered important local resources like mines and mills or escorting trading caravans. The main duties, however, would probably have been patrolling, either along the line of the wall or to the lands to the north. The local British tribes were known to be hostile and ready to attack without warning. Hadrian sent over, we know from an inscription, 3,000 legionaries from, other, from Spain and Germany, to, presumably to replace gaps in the ranks. The regiment of Tungrians that was stationed here was a thousand strong, and for a few years it was down to 500. Well, that again is an example. So I think there were pretty heavy losses. Hadrian had to do something. The local British tribes were forbidden to gather in large numbers, except at times and in places defined by treaty. Keeping an eye on them to be sure they were obeying this treaty would have been a major part of the duties for the soldiers stationed on and near the wall. Hadrian's Wall was finished, and life had settled into a routine. But again, all this was to change. Emperor Antoninus Pius, who replaced Hadrian after his death, ordered a fresh assault on the northern clans in 138 AD. This was a highly successful campaign and pushed back the northern tribes. A new wall, the Antonine Wall, was built further north from the Forth to the Clyde, but they kept the bathhouses inside these forts. Perhaps a sign of greater hostilities in this region. It also had more forts than Hadrian's, which also perhaps goes to show they were experiencing greater danger. Meanwhile, back at Hadrian's Wall, the evidence shows signs of evacuation. The Vallum mounds were breached and the ditches filled in. The garrisons in the forts were reduced to caretaker size. Even the gates at the mild castles were taken off their hinges. The frontiers of Rome had been pushed further into the lands of the barbarians. But not for long. Seventeen years later, the Brigantes revolted, and within six months, Hadrian's Wall had been reoccupied and its defences hardened in the face of this new threat. This pattern of events, expansion followed by retreat, was to be repeated at least once more in the following 20 years, until the wall ceased to be an effective frontier marker for the once proud empire. One of the uh, things you've got to bear in mind about Hadrian's Wall is that it was a typical multi-million pound government job. Um, you know, it was built and completed in Hadrian's lifetime. A few years later, Hadrian then dies. What happens to this huge, vast project? 
short answer is it's, it's abandoned, it's boarded up, and they go back into Scotland for a while under Antoninus Pius. And for ten odd years, it must have just been mothballed down here. Now, as it happens, they find they, they don't want to stay in Scotland for a variety of reasons, and the wall is then reoccupied. And it, it is more or less maintained, with a few hiccups, uh, to the end of the Roman period of rule. On all the forts, there are signs of destruction from time to time and rebuilding. Um, but the destruction, it's difficult to say whether that's destruction at enemy hands or whether it's destruction because the Roman soldiers had gone away and the natives had wandered in and pinched what they could. Now, the story is of decline. Records speak of the British tribes crossing the wall in force about 180 AD. It looks like they were able to burst through the center without opposition, but the rest of the wall was untouched. It was after this that Roman troops were pulled back towards Rome from Britain to help with Clodius Albinus's attempt to become emperor, and the British tribes saw their chance. There were great battles and much destruction. Shortly after this, a various lupus was sent from Rome to buy off these northern tribes. It seems that Roman money was still highly valued by the Britons. For the next 200 years or so, there was peace on the wall. There are signs of refurbishment and rebuilding, but by 400 AD, the final garrison had gone. The wall was left deserted to the elements and the sky. The slow process of decay and destruction now began. The Anglo-Saxons replaced the Romans, and while a few of their objects have been found on the wall, in the main these newcomers passed it by. Maybe they feared the might and power that had raised this set of marking stones. Perhaps some descendants of the soldiers continued to live in the forts or their associated civilian settlements. We cannot say. They withdraw their uh, authority from Britain, tell the Britons to look after themselves, and you get chaos. You get the breakdown of law and order, and with the breakdown of law and order, the breakdown of trade, and with that, you no way can you maintain this huge population up here. People drift away. A few people would stay on, uh, subsistence farming and so on. And then eventually you get the Anglo-Saxons, the Vikings, and all this lot coming in. Um, and the wall ceases to exist. Only at Vindolanda has any post-Roman inscription been found. And that dates to about only 500 AD. But the wall had not been forgotten and accounts by writers of the time after the Romans have persisted to the present day. Most notable is that of the Venerable Bede, who in about 730 AD gave a good description of it. He said it was then eight feet wide and 12 feet high. This account may well have resulted from his own observations as his monastery at Jarrow lay close to the eastern end of the wall. But when it came to dating the wall or to its purpose, he depended more on local garbled tales. He assigned a date some 250 years too late for its building and presented the erroneous view that it had been built to keep out the Picts and the Scots. This view has continued until the present day. Through the centuries that followed, the wall became a quarry stone, one so hard from the ground by the hands of Roman legionaries, was easy pickings for those building churches, houses, farms, or even simple dry stone walls. People begin to settle in here again. You then get the enclosure movement and people create these fields. They needed field boundaries. Roman sites again, wonderful. Hadrian's Wall, look at all this stone. All the field walls around here are built out of the stone from these Roman remains. 
in the 18th century, for example, after Bonnie Prince Charlie had, had been through creating panic, they decided to make sure that communications were better, so they built a new road a few years later between Newcastle and Carlisle, and when they got to the Hadrian's Wall area, they said, ah, just what we need to make a road, and uh, n nobody thought twice about it. Stones were carried miles, and other raiders came to plunder the once proud wall. King John, in 1201, sent men to dig for treasure. They found only stone. Local brigands in the 17th century used housesteads as their base from which to range out over the local countryside. And the local gentry, when they wanted to decorate and adorn their great houses with inscriptions and sculpture, came to the wall to join in with the destruction. It was 300 years after the excavations of King John that the age of serious observations began. Accounts from the 16th century still prove a useful, if not valuable, record of the state of the wall at that time. In fact, it was not until the writings of the Reverend John Hodgson in 1840 that the wall, its forts and valor were correctly attributed to Hadrian and his time. This was also the time of excavation along the wall. Site reports record the continuing decline and disappearance of this once proud frontier marker. All this was reversed mainly through the work of one man, John Clayton of Chester's. During his long life, 1792 to 1890, he bought many miles of the wall and several of its forts from the local landowners. He then proceeded to dig up the walls, turrets, mile castles, and parts of the forts at Chester's and Housteds. He even built a museum into which he gathered his finds. That still stands today and can be visited at Chester's. He set the pattern for the work that was to follow and which continues to this day. It was during the years leading up to 1939 that many of the puzzles and problems about the wall, its associated buildings and defences, and overall purpose were solved. Nevertheless, there are still large areas where our knowledge is imperfect. There remains much to be discovered about the wall and its true place in Roman history. The remains that haven't yet been excavated, and that must be about 98% of Adrian's Wall hasn't yet been excavated, they're safe under the turf, protected as well as they can be by ancient monuments legislation, which means that even archaeologists, uh, if they want to look at these remains, have to get special permission from the Secretary of State to excavate and examine what's under the ground. So it's reasonably safe now, what's left of it. Large swathes of the wall have now passed into the care of the nation. Some parts are looked after by English heritage, others by the National Trust, while still more areas are cared for by charitable trusts. Now the main work is conservation rather than restoration. And much of the wall itself has been consolidated following the ravages of time and stone robbers. The wall is photographed and drawn as it is before the stones are removed one by one. They are numbered and placed to one side. When the original Roman mortar is reached, everything is cleaned and washed. Then the stones are replaced in what is thought to have been their original position using modern mortar. No attempt is made to restore the wall and no new stone is added. At sites like Vindolanda, there are reconstructions of Roman buildings. This blend of old and new makes the site an ideal one to visit for tourists or school parties wishing to learn more about the life of Romans in Britain and on the wall. This is a form of experimental archaeology because actually building something on the lines of, of Hadrian's Wall or some of these turf and timber 
constructions and digging ditches to Roman specifications, you get an idea of how many man hours it takes and you know how much water you need to mix the cement and all that kind of thing. And then the other point is, uh, 15, 20 years on, you can see what sort of state it's, of, uh, it's in, whether these turf uh, ramparts or wooden towers have started collapsing or not, so you can get some idea of, 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 of that aspect of it too. So, as you stand at Housteads and survey where once Roman soldiers from across the empire lived and worked under the shadow of the northern threat, and as you stand at Steel Rig or on any of the crags, looking north into the same biting wind and feeling the same hail on your cheeks, think of the men who worked on the wall. Belgians, Syrians and Moroccans pulled far from their homelands to guard this furthest flung part of a once proud and powerful empire. Remember too those archaeologists of the 19th century and beyond. Without their work, Hadrian's Wall would be one of Britain's and the world's lost treasures. pyramids have risen up out of the sands of Egypt as a proud testament to the nature of human achievement. They are both monuments to that which endures and to that which fades away. Their original grandeur has been sandblasted by time, but these man-made mountains, the product of many thousands of hours of sweat and blood, now stand as fixed points in the North African landscape. They are as natural a part of it as the desert plains, the mountains, or the great river Nile. Modern Egypt is very far removed from the ancient nation of the pyramid builders, but still her pyramids form a focus for national pride and identity. They are a legacy which has been handed down to the Egyptians from ancestors who believed in multiple gods and whose government was imposed by ruling dynasties. The great rulers of these dynasties were the Egyptian pharaohs, the creators of the pyramids. Anyone who has visited Egypt will have visited the pyramids and the sheer size immediately fills you with such awe that you begin to want to find out more, I think. The pyramids and the Sphinx are the symbols of Egyptian culture more than any other. If you want to invoke the culture of ancient Egypt, you stick a picture of the pyramids or the Sphinx on it and it automatically calls up all those associations. Well, one thing worth bearing in mind is up until the early part of this century, the Great Pyramid at Giza was the tallest building ever created by mankind and still the sheer mass of stone, it's the most massive building ever created, which is fairly amazing given it's one of the earliest buildings of mankind. When the first pyramid was built, Western Europe was still shrouded in the mists of prehistory. Stonehenge would not be built for another 500 years or more. Civilization grew in Egypt, as it would elsewhere, on the banks of a river. The Nile, the great life provider in an otherwise hostile environment. 
The Egyptians considered the river to be a god and that it was Kunu, the god of creation, who caused the river to swell. The south of Egypt was as arid as it is today. But in the north, where the land was low, lay the wide delta of the Nile, which was cool and marshy. After the river had flooded and receded, the land would be left covered by mud washed down from the African interior. The whole of the Nile Valley would then become fertile. The Nile, I think we can say, was the lifeline for the ancient Egyptians. It was the fact that the Nile flooded every year that meant that the ancient Egyptians had fertile land. And this fertile land enabled them to pretty much every year grow a good enough crop to then feed the people. And if it hadn't been for that annual flooding of the Nile and the new deposit of thick black Nile silt that was laid down each year, then the ancient Egyptians just would not have been able to feed their population. Egyptian farmers could then grow crops such as wheat, barley and fruit, as well as papyrus reeds, from which they made paper. Papyrus was perhaps the single most important crop as far as the creation of a civilization was concerned. The Egyptians had developed a written language by 3000 BC. The chief minister of the land under the pharaoh was also the agriculture minister, which reveals what an important role crops played in Egyptian life. Centuries later, when Egypt was an eastern province of the Roman Empire, it was as an area of arable production that it was most valued. It was cultivation of the land that led to other forms of cultivation. The organization of food production allowed time and manpower for the development of writing, arts and building, and in turn, a highly advanced civilization. The cradle of Egyptian civilization was founded on the Nile's regular flooding and ability to sustain life. The Nile provides all kinds of things. First of all, it's the highway of Egypt. Egypt itself really is constrained to the, the, the narrow territory on either side of the Nile, so therefore all transport really could go along there. It also meant that it also was the source of food, fish and so on comes from there, and the inundation the annual flooding of the Nile was the whole base of the agriculture of Egypt. So without the Nile, there would not have been an Egypt, there still wouldn't be an Egypt. But this culture, which relied so much upon the life given by the Nile, was also one which was very much preoccupied with death. The first pyramid arose in the time of Zosa, who reigned as pharaoh from 2667 to 2648 BC. During this time, the Nile had failed to flood for seven years, resulting in a lengthy and severe famine. Perhaps it was this which caused Zosa to contemplate his own death. He employed the architect Imhotep to build him a mausoleum which would be incomparable to anything ever made by man. So important did Zosa deem the task that he honored Imhotep with the title of sculptor builder and chief minister of the land. Imhotep is a fascinating figure. His memory survived down through the generations and by the Greco-Roman period he became a god. But his, his fame goes right back to early times. The fact there was a statue base was found in the enclosure of the Step Pyramid. It was a statue base of the king himself. And normally such a statue base would perhaps have the king's name and members of his family. But this has the name of Imhotep on it as well. Prior to this, such large structures had been made with mud bricks. But for this project, Imhotep used stone 
and stone was the material which would remain in favour from then on in. To begin with, a stone base was built, ten and a half metres high. This was surmounted by three squares of diminishing size, positioned symmetrically and forming steps on the four sides. The base was then enlarged, allowing for two additional steps. These early pyramids are known as step pyramids and are clearly distinguished from the smooth later pyramids by their giant step sides. Through the dynasties which followed, the Egyptians built nearly a hundred pyramids. In fact, it would be true to say that it became Egypt's biggest industry. During the period that we refer to as the pyramid building era, a considerable number of the ancient Egyptian people would have been put to working the pyramids. So this, of course, means that these people are then given employment and this will then generate a whole uh, a whole host of other associated industries, such as feeding those people, such as supplying the tools, such as supplying work for people in the area around Aswan where they were quarrying the granite. Uh, of course, the supervisors, the administrative officials. Then, of course, once the pyramid is completed, a funerary cult developed around the pyramid site with associated temples, and we have a whole host of uh, Wab priests, purified priests, lector priests, the priests who spoke the spells of the daily rituals of the king, the deceased king spirit. And so there was a whole associated industry that evolved around the pyramid building. Although pyramid building was continued for centuries, it is the pyramids that were built during the time of the Old Kingdom on the site at Giza, just a short distance from the royal palace at Memphis, which have caught the eternal imagination. It is no wonder that these giants have earned a place among the seven wonders of the world. Cheops, who reigned from 2589 to 2566 BC, commissioned a pyramid of such size and splendor that it took 30 years to complete. I think that at the time they were complete, the pyramids would have been regarded with great awe by people um, who saw them. First of all, we've got to remember what else they can see in the built environment at that time. It's, it's not very impressive. And these great um, polished structures coming off the horizon would have seemed uh, quite, quite awesome. The Greek historian Herodotus, writing 2,000 years after the event, claimed that the pyramids used the labour of around 100,000 workmen at any one time. In all likelihood, only about 8,000 would work in a shift. Any more men, especially 92,000 more, would have got in each other's way. Herodotus' further claim that these men were slaves is equally untrue. There are probably two basic groups of people involved in this. First of all, there were the skilled workmen who were working on the pyramids all the time. They were the skilled masons, artists, um, overseers, all those sorts of people. But then, probably working on a seasonal basis, were basically farmers, other labourers, who were brought in from the point of view of dragging stone up to the site. So probably when they were otherwise unengaged, when they were working on their fields, the permanent staff would actually be doing the actual job of bringing everything together and building the pyramid, whereas say the, during the periods of the inundation when the fields are underwater, farmers and their families would be brought in to drag the stone close up to the building site. The building of a structure meant to protect the dead pharaoh was an honour, 
The pyramids were intended as resting places for the pharaohs. Somewhere they were protected and preserved for the afterlife. A measure of the honour of the task was that the workers were fed from the royal stores. Mainly it would appear on onions, often at times when food elsewhere was in very short supply. They were provided with free accommodation as well as food, but in return for this, the work they undertook must have been arduous at best and dangerous at worst. These people are doing work that is so unbelievably strenuous, that is in a climate which at the best of times is, is fairly warm, and they were living in mud brick housing, very close together, smelly. It would have been pretty grim, I would have thought. And yet these people are necessary. They need to be kept alive, of course. So these people were being given homes, they were being well fed, but it must have been fairly dire. Pyramid building was really a turning point in the history of man because it was our first large-scale application of technology. It required organization of manpower and correct application of tools and materials. The first 10 years were taken up with preparation. First, the builders cleared the site of sand, then leveled the stone. To do this, they had to rely on tools made of hard stone or of copper, which had to be constantly sharpened or replaced, creating work for coppersmiths. When this task was completed, they dug a tunnel, running steeply down into the rock, and a burial chamber was carved out deep underground. This was the first of three such chambers, which would eventually lie beneath or within the finished structure. Nearly all of the pyramids contained a subterranean structure, as well as an internal system, although no two of these were the same. Much of the next 10 years were taken up with quarrying and shaping measured blocks of limestone from a site in the Mokhtan Hills. These blocks formed the great foundation which covered 13 acres. The transportation of the finished building blocks from the quarry to the site at Giza depended, as so much of Egyptian life did, on the flood pattern of the Nile. When the water level was at its height, the blocks were floated downstream on barges. They were then unloaded onto a specially constructed landing wharf. A massive ramp was also built, via which the great blocks could be hauled to their destination as the pyramid took shape. There's a number of different categories of stone built going into the pyramids. First of all, there's the simple core blocks, and those were quarried very close to the pyramids, within a few hundred yards if possible. Next there was the much finer quality limestone which was used for sheathing the outside of the pyramid and that was quarried just across the river at a place called Tura um, and that was floated over on barges during the flood seasons. There was also very some hard specialist stone like granite, basalt and so on. These came from other parts of Egypt and here the Nile became absolutely fundamental because the quarries for granite were down at Aswan oh, a couple of hundred miles south of, of the pyramid sites. So the river was, was the only way these great blocks of this very hard, very prized stone granite were brought up to the pyramid plateau. Cheops Pyramid, built in the late 4th dynasty, contains 2,003,000 blocks of stone, some weighing as much as 60 tonnes. Some of the largest stones were used to form the roofs of the burial chambers. The enormous stone tomb, known as a sarcophagus, in which the body of the pharaoh was to be laid, was first lowered into the burial chamber. The sarcophagus would have been far too large to carry through the complex small tunnels. This was done by filling the chamber up with sand, hauling the sarcophagus on top, 
then removing the sand from the chamber, which in turn gradually lowered the tomb. The sarcophagus was finally placed into a hole, which was specially prepared for it in the floor of the burial chamber. When this was done, more sand was then piled in, this time forming a mound on top of which the giant slabs of stone could be supported as they were set in position over the chamber. The stones were arranged to lean into one another, forming a roof shape, so that when the sand was removed, each took the weight of the opposing stone. The weight of the stones, which would be built on top of this roof, would further push the stones together. But the inverted V arrangement would ensure that the burden was transferred to the surrounding stones, of which there would be an abundance. The visible structure above the ground, the pyramid we can see, is formed from a mastaba. The first and second dynasty kings were being buried in what we refer to as mastaba tombs. And this is from the Arabic word for bench, because what we have is a superstructure, which is a mound, basically. So the earlier kings of the early dynastic period were being buried in subterranean tombs with mound-style superstructures. And what we find is that the later tombs at Saqqara are in fact stepped, mud-brick stepped superstructures. So we don't have a leap out of the blue when in the Third Dynasty Zosa chose to create a stepped superstructure to his burial. What he did decide to do was to make it quite enormous and to create it out of stone. The giant superstructure of the pyramid had the same function as the mastaba, the visible outer monument, rather like the front of the pharaoh's house. The Greek historian Herodotus, whose account of the pyramid is remarkable for its combination of hard research and shrewd speculation, described its construction. The pyramid was constructed in tiers or steps, something like battlements. And when the base was completed, the remaining blocks were lifted up by a kind of crane made of short timbers onto the first tier. On this first tier, there was another lifting crane which raised the blocks higher still. It must be remembered that Herodotus was writing many centuries after the events he describes, and it's possible he was inferring the use of the cranes from seeing similar structures at the time, perhaps serving to raise water from the Nile for purposes of irrigation. But it's also possible that this is indeed how they lifted the great blocks of stone. These machines could have been built of timber from the great cedars of Lebanon, from which the Egyptians also built their boats. Herodotus also describes how they completed the pyramid and marvels at the costliness of it all. The finishing off of the pyramid started at the top and worked downwards, ending with the parts nearest the ground. An inscription on the pyramid in Egyptian characters records the amount spent on horseradish, onion and heads of garlic. And if I remember what the interpreter who read me the inscription said, the sum involved was 1,600 talents of silver. If this is true, how much must have been spent on the iron used, on other foodstuffs, and on the clothes of the laborers? I think we need to be quite careful about using Herodotus's account of the building of the pyramids. First of all, we need to consider that Herodotus is writing in the uh, 5th century BC, so thousands of years after the uh, pyramids were actually built. Secondly, I think we need to think of Herodotus's broader agenda, which is really to talk about the conflict between the culture of Greece and the culture of, of the East, in which Egypt obviously plays an important part. So he isn't really trying to write an authoritative and reliable history. He has broader agendas, I think. So I think we do have to take Herodotus with a pinch of salt. We also have to remember that very likely he was being fed information by Egyptian priests who couldn't necessarily converse in Greek and so Herodotus was perhaps communicating them with them through an interpreter. Perhaps they uh, considered uh, that they, they wouldn't for one moment tell Herodotus the mysteries of their ancient traditions and so perhaps they 
they chose to lead him up the garden path. Zosa's step pyramid looks as if six mastabas, or layers of stone, each one smaller than the last, have simply been put on top of one another. It was in 1837 that the discovery was made that the step pyramid consists of an accumulation of vertical steep buttress walls, which slope inwards at an angle of 75 degrees. The buttress walls decrease in height in stages towards the outside of the pyramid, giving the impression that it's made up of horizontally formed layers. Imhotep had discovered a way to make tall structures safe, and this stable design formed the basis for all pyramids. But for all the work and all the profound significance that was afforded it on its inception, this pyramid like those which succeeded it, was to be overtaken by time, both universal and personal. Its religious purpose as a mausoleum was forgotten, and it was plundered by those without the ability or the inclination to quarry stone for themselves. And sand, blown relentlessly into its sides by the desert winds, have eroded it over the centuries. The result is that the pyramid has been reduced by some 30 feet from its original height of 481 feet. The pyramids of Zosa and his successor, Sekemket, are located at Saqqara, close to the capital of Memphis. These are the only large pyramids close to the capital, the rest of them having been erected well away from the city. Whilst the foundations of the pyramid nation were laid in the third dynasty by Zosa and his architect Himotep, it was the fourth dynasty founded by the pharaoh Snofru, which is renowned for the great stone pyramids. Snofru is probably the greatest of all the pyramid builders. He actually built four pyramids during his lifetime, one of which was abandoned during, due to structural failure, Another one was actually used for his burial, and one was a, some kind of, of, of a cenotaph. The other one is most interesting, because it started off life as a step pyramid, but was converted into a true pointy pyramid while it was under construction. And that's the big difference between the Third Dynasty and the Fourth Dynasty. Third Dynasty, you have these stepped monuments, the step pyramids. In the Fourth, it's the true pyramids, which remain the standard form of pyramid right through to the end of pyramid building. Following on from him, of course, his son, Cheops, built the largest of all the pyramids. Cheops' pyramid stands today, 20 miles north of Memphis at Giza. Not only is this the largest pyramid, it is still the largest stone building in the world. No cathedral, not even St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, comes close to competing with it. Its structure is so sound that the first archaeologists to explore it were able to blast out entrances with gunpowder, secure in the knowledge that it would not collapse. Cheops' pyramid covers an area of 230 meters square, rises to a height of almost 150 meters, and is made up of about six and a half million tons of limestone. As such, it remains one of the seven wonders of the world. Originally, the pyramid would have been clad with white Tura limestone, giving it a smooth appearance, but unfortunately, it's been completely stripped of its casing. The pyramid contains a polar entrance in the north face, a feature which is common to all the pyramids from the fourth dynasty onwards. By the fourth dynasty, the dead pharaoh was regarded as a companion to the sun god, and the circumpolar stars were linked to the king's burial chamber by the direction of the entrance passage. It would be wonderful to know what the people actually thought when they looked at a pyramid. And if only we had their musings recorded, their jottings. What we have to assume is that a pyramid to the ancient Egyptians was symbolic of kingship, was symbolic of the power of the king and very importantly was 
an icon of the solar element to the religion. Because for the ancient Egyptians, the flooding of the Nile, coupled with the creative power of the sun, meant that they could live. When Cheops' son, Kephron, became pharaoh in around 2566 BC, he commissioned a pyramid of his own. Though containing a mere 60,000 cubic feet of stone and weighing only about 5,310,000 tons, it was not one to rival his father's in scale. The new pyramid had a far less complex internal structure too, containing just one burial chamber. However, Kephron was a pharaoh who awarded himself unlimited power and was perhaps the first to give himself the title, the Great God. It would appear that the smaller size of the pyramid was related to its being built uphill from the first one, with the aim that its summit should equal it in altitude. Kephren built the second largest of all the pyramids, the so-called Second Pyramid of Giza, which, although smaller in volume and actual height to his father's, it actually looks higher when you're actually on site at Giza because it's on higher ground. Situated 500 feet southwest of Cheops' pyramid, Kephren's is positioned so that the diagonals of the two lie along the same straight line. The white Tura limestone casing has remained intact on the upper part of the pyramid, revealing how closely this casing fitted together and how smooth the entire pyramid must have been. Though in terms of size, this pyramid may have been less impressive than its predecessor at 140 meters, it was given a protector, which is the only ancient monument in Egypt to rival the pyramids. This monument immediately strikes the onlooker with awe and in its sheer recognizability, the Great Sphinx. There are a lot of theories about the purpose of the Sphinx. Uh, my own is that it's some kind of boundary marker for the Giza Plateau. It's something which sets it apart as a sort of sacred area. But it's important to remember that the Egyptians themselves forget what it's for. So uh, after the Old Kingdom um, in, in the 18th dynasty, 1400 years after it was built, it's thought to be a representation of the god ha Harmachis, Horus of the Horizon. And later on, Herodotus is told uh, something completely different as well. So uh, it's important to remember that the, it, it is something which slips out of popular memory. The Sphinx, like much of Egyptian antiquity, does remain a mystery to us. And we can only speculate as to why Kefren chose to create out of this natural limestone desert in escarpment, an incredible monument. A lion form body with the human head, with the Nemes headdress. And it's often suggested that this is a guardian figure as it's alongside his valley temple. In Arabic, this giant sculpture is known as Abu al Hol, the father of terror. Representing a creature with the body of a lion, but the face of a human, it seems to combine the most distinctive attributes of both. The impassive face suggests an enigmatic intelligence. The body exudes power and natural authority. Some believe the face to be that of Kefren himself, set to watch over his last resting place before his journey to the next world. As to the theory that it's a portrait of Kefren, it's difficult. But it does seem to be that a pharaoh is being shown because he is wearing the so-called Nemes headcloth, which is generally a indicator of pharaonic status. So whichever, whoever is being represented here, he, he is in, in some, some way anyway uh, a pharaoh. Kefren's son, Mycerinus, also erected a pyramid when he ascended to power. Though smaller again, covering only about half the area occupied by that of Cheops, this pyramid is considered by many to be the finest of those at Giza. 
Mycerinus's pyramid is interesting because it's half of its casing stones are actually granite rather than limestone. And as far as one, one can look at the detail of the building, it's more finely built. The, sort of, there are less rough edges, if you like. But it also really marks the end of the great pyramid of, period of pyramid building. Subsequent pyramids are far less well built and nowadays look little more than piles of rubble in quite a few cases. So it's on size, my Serenus's pyramid is much smaller than the previous two. But yeah, the actual effort expended on various elements of it is probably equal to them. Although the pharaohs continued to build pyramids, all the great pyramids were built in a space of just 100 years during the fourth dynasty. There was a distinct downwards turn in standards and size in the following fifth dynasty. But however impressive the outsides of the pyramids were, it was what they were to contain which most concerned those who first commissioned them. For these tombs of such massive volume and weight were made to contain just a single body, that of the pharaoh. Ancient Egyptians worshipped many gods. There were nine chief gods, among them Nut, the goddess of the sky, Geb, the god of the earth, Tefnut, the goddess of water, and Ra, the sun god. But even he was rivaled in prominence by Osiris, the god of the dead. He was supposed to have been murdered by the evil god Seth, his brother. Osiris having been killed by his wicked brother Seth and the killing involved being cut up into a number of pieces. Osiris's sister who was also his consort or wife Isis very much associated with magic and healing in Egyptian religion she then makes this grand pilgrimage to gather together the parts of Osiris's body and then create a whole by embalming and mummifying the body. The kingdom of Osiris, it was taught, lay over the horizon to the west and under the earth. It was in this place that the ordinary Egyptian citizen would hope his spirit would reside after death. The pharaoh, however, was believed to be divine. In fact, he was believed to be Horus, the god who had brought Osiris back to life and who had killed the evil Seth. For him, eternity lay, according to some, in ruling over the kingdom of Osiris, and according to others, in the heavens with Ra the sun god. But like Osiris, it also lay in mummification. Mummification was intended to preserve the body forever. The reasoning behind this seems to be connected with a view that for the spirit to survive intact in the afterworld, the body had to remain intact on earth as well, as a conduit, if you like. The origins of the idea that you needed to do this to a body seems to go back to what happened to bodies in prehistoric times when they were interred in the hot sand of Egypt. The hot sand naturally desiccates, dries out the bodies. And one suspects that, they, that when the Egyptians noticed that after they started building proper tombs and putting the bodies in chambers rather than in the sand, they started to decay. There may have been some thought, hang on, if sort of nature is, making, is, is drying out these bodies and preserving them, does that mean there is something important about that drying out for the afterlife? All wealthy Egyptians were mummified, and if they were not wealthy, then they were buried naked on their sides, facing the west, and sand would dry the body, preserving it as effectively. 
The body of the pharaoh was laid out on a boat beneath a canopy with a lamp burning in its bow. Two professional mourners, representing Isis and Nephthys, would stand in attendance. Then the body would be taken down the Nile to the final resting place at Giza, which he himself had commissioned. The great river, whose nourishing floods had sustained his life and provided the means by which the stones of his mausoleum had been transported from the quarries, now served him one more time. The short journey up the Nile represented the journey that the pharaoh would shortly make to heaven. Eventually, the boat in which this journey was taken would be dismantled and buried by the mortuary temple at the base of the pyramid. Facing west, it would wait to take the pharaoh on his final voyage to the kingdom of Osiris. The next 70 days would be taken up with mummification by priests of the Guild of Embalmers. The remains were then washed and infused with natron, and then each part was separately bandaged. The ancient Egyptians used this naturally occurring salt, natron, to dry out the body artificially and then wrapped it in linen bandaging and used other various ingredients to create a preserved body. The entrails, the heart, liver, stomach and intestines were kept in four canopic jars on which were carved the heads of the gods thought to protect these organs. After the mummy had been lain in a wooden coffin, the priests performed a religious ceremony called the Sach. They believed that this enabled the pharaoh's ka, his spirit, to re-enter the mummified body. Like the Vikings many centuries later, the Egyptians believed in supplying the dead for their journey to the New World. The burial chambers in the pyramids were provided with jewellery, incense and clothes. Food or even stone representations of food were often left. The pharaoh would need sustenance for his journey. In fact, thereafter, priests would regularly leave offerings of food at the pyramid to provide for the pharaoh's ka. The Egyptians have quite a complex set of beliefs about the nature of the body and the spirit. First of all, the, the personality is split into multiple parts. So it's very different from this Western idea of the body being the, the corporeal element and the spirit being just one thing. So for instance, uh, not only do you have the, the ba and the ka, which are the ones that people are most familiar with, the Egyptians also have other spiritual components, such as the, the ach, which is the transfigured part of the personality when uh, it attains union with Osiris, uh, the shoot, the shadow, and the name. There, there are many, many other parts of it. The priest's next ceremony was that of opening the mouth. These involved statues of the pharaoh, sculpted by the royal sculptors on lines laid down in the official book of the artist. Their creation, as well as their final use, was a matter of religion. When the statue was completed, the name of the pharaoh was inscribed on its base, and at this point it was believed to become the pharaoh himself. The ceremony for which they were produced again followed the myth of Osiris. As each statue is touched on the mouth by a priest, taking on the role which they believe to have been played by Horus, so the pharaoh's ka enters it, giving his spirit multiple resting places. It was only on completion of this ceremony that the pharaoh's coffin was carried through a tunnel into the depths of the pyramid where the burial chamber had been prepared. Lowered into the sarcophagus, covered by the great stone lid which was then sealed, the mummified remains were left to take their place in eternity. Some believed that the pharaoh ascended to heaven and to Ra, but others maintained that as the pharaoh had been Horus on earth, in heaven he became Azarus. 
a new Horus, a new pharaoh, would rule over the mortals on Earth, while the old pharaoh, Osiris, would guard them from his fortified tomb. We know that from as early as the ancient Egyptians were constructing what we'd call tombs, they were using security measures to try and keep the tomb robbers out. But, ultimately, the fortification proved inadequate. Not a single one of the pyramids remained completely unplundered, and the evidence seems to suggest that they were plundered pretty soon after the burials were actually deposited in there. Plundering the pyramids has gone on uh, into recorded history. So, for instance, in medieval times, the caliphs who were ruling Egypt blew up parts of the pyramids because they believed they were filled with gold. And then in the 19th century, when European collectors start getting very interested in Egyptian monuments, that's when large-scale uh, looting goes on. The Egyptians continued to build pyramids to house their pharaoh's sacred remains as well as complex necropoli, such as those at Memphis, Dashur, Thebes, and most famously, in the Valley of the Kings. But none of these would rival the pyramids at Giza for scale or endurance. All of these structures were built with one purpose in mind, to cheat the passage of time and defeat death as Azaras had. Yet if the almighty pharaohs failed to cheat death, they did, in their commissioning of the pyramids, at least leave a legacy. The pyramids, probably more so than any other monument of the past, seem to have gripped the human imagination. They were a tourist attraction even in ancient Egyptian times. Of course, the pharaohs themselves would have absolutely welcomed this because the whole idea in Egyptian belief was if your name survived on the lips of the living, you survived for eternity. People, I think, are still fascinated by the pyramids because they are so enormous and because they are so old. And people are still studying these structures because we actually know so little about them. There is still so much to learn about the pyramids and that, I think, is why people continue to be mystified by them or inspired by them and, very importantly, are still studying and researching those pyramids. But the pyramids, it must be remembered, were emphatically not the work of just one man. There were astronomers, architects, engineers, not to mention the legions of laborers who were needed to complete each massive project. And it is perhaps these people, as much as their ruler, who live on to some extent in the weathered, ravaged remains of the Great Pyramids. It is perhaps their car which inhabits the stone. Even today, Rome is a city which fascinates us with its mixture of the sophisticated and the romantic, the sacred and the profane. This modern, bustling city is also the place where the treasures of the Renaissance stand side by side with the stark edifices of Mussolini's Italy. And in amongst it all are reminders of the great civilization which stood on the same seven hills.
The beginnings of that civilization are shrouded in legend, in the twin brothers Romulus and Remus, who were nursed by wolves, but who grew up to found the great city in 753 BC. Archaeologists now believe that Rome began around 3,000 years ago as a collection of wooden huts on seven hills beside the river Tiber. But however humble its origins may have been, the city which developed would become, over the following 1,000 years, so sophisticated in its social structures and so effective in its political and legal ordering that it would take over the known world and prove the basis of the culture which the West still calls its own. In a very real sense, when we look at the treasures of ancient Rome, we are looking into our own beginnings. You think of all the things we've got from Roman culture, its language, Latin, uh, its law, um, a tremendous amount of our uh, artistic and architectural heritage um, is ultimately derived from the Roman world. And of course, ancient Rome as the heart of that ancient world is um, potentially the source uh, for everything that we understand to be classical civilization. Romulus, so the story goes, founded the city on the Palatine Hill in 753 BC. A small village in a not very prepossessing location with its marketplace on marshy ground between the Palatine and the Capitoline Hills grew to be the birthplace of modern civilization. It was not a quick nor an easy transition and the martial history of Rome is marked at its outset by many defeats at the hands of the other Italian tribes of the time but their persistence paid off, and by the third century BC, the Romans had conquered most of Italy. This brought them into conflict with the Greeks. It was the conquering of this more advanced people that propelled the Romans into becoming great cultural as well as great martial imperialists. The arts and sciences of Greece flowed into Rome medicine, astronomy, literature, rhetoric, and of course, architecture. The Romans had the largest empire that um, the Western world has really ever known in terms of the physical extent of it. And in the sense that they conquered the whole of the, the world in terms of peoples and places, they also uh, conquered nature to some extent. If you think about Roman roads, Roman aqueducts, Roman harbours, they were changing the shape of the whole of the, the landscape, cutting roads through mountains, making tunnels, cuttings, taking water over land, so therefore making rivers, making solid structures in the sea. But you can also see it if you actually look at the city of Rome itself, because although Rome started off as a city on seven famous hills, but also perhaps another uh, three or four. Not all of these hills are now anything like the shape they were when the Romans began. Particularly something like the Palatine Hill has been levelled on the top, it's been extended on the sides. The building of Domitian's Palace, for example, involved cutting away part of the hill to create the sunken stadium, but also building up and terracing out towards the Forum. And the sort of views and panoramas that we get today are largely a result of Roman reshaping of the whole of the Palatine Hill. The view from the Palatine Hill is perhaps the best preserved of its features. A feature, of course, which owes its existence to no human architect. In the distance, the original occupants of the royal palaces would have been able to see the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill, and in the valley below they would have seen the Roman Forum. Well, the Forum uh, actually is in origin, simply an open space in the valley bottom between 
um, three of the major hills of Rome. It is a sort of rather marshy inlet from the Tiber which separates the Palatine Hill, the Capitoline Hill and the Quirinal Hill. And as such, it, it was a sort of communal meeting place. It, parts of it on the fringes seem to have been used as cemetery, but the, the main sort of central part gradually grew up um, as a marketplace and as a, a political centre. The excavations which have been carried out there, it's the one area in Rome which has actually been consciously excavated for archaeological purposes. It was excavated towards the end of the last century, between about 1880 and 1910. Um, there were concerted efforts to actually expose the Roman Forum. And what we have on the ground now, in fact, as, as ever with the rest of uh, Rome, is its final phase rather than its beginnings. The remains of this site have been excavated and have stood the test of time, whereas the Palatine has not. Although the Forum was founded with Rome in the 8th century BC, those ruins which can be seen on the site are, like those of the Palatine, mostly of a much later date. For instance, what remains of the Temple of Saturn, the god who was father to Jupiter, the chief Roman god, he whose temple sat on the Capitoline Hill, are six Ionic pillars which date from its rebuilding in about 370 AD. There is nothing left of the original which was built in 497 BC. Likewise, the Temple of Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, was first built in the 6th century BC as no more than a wooden hut. But the remains we can see here date from the 3rd century AD. It was here that the great symbol of Rome's endurance was tended, the eternal flame. Its maintenance was entrusted to the Vestal priestess, and the sacredness of their vocation was such that each was expected to swear an oath of chastity and to keep it on pain of being buried alive. The remains of their house can also be seen, although again the traces of this building, dating from after 64 AD, hide those of the much more ancient building which would have sheltered the first of the Vestal Virgins. Beyond this can be seen the most famous of the treasures of ancient Rome. And this is no solemn place of worship, dedicated to a god or deified man, nor is it an arch erected to celebrate some triumph by a great emperor. It is a monument to the Romans' ability to enjoy themselves, and enjoy themselves in ways which would turn the stomachs of most people today. Commissioned in 72 AD as the Flavian Amphitheatre and built in the grounds of Nero's Golden Palace, the Colosseum was completed in the reign of Titus in 80 AD. That any of it remains is a wonder. That despite being used as a quarry throughout the Renaissance period, it is still a mighty structure is a miracle. It is oval in shape, some 200 metres long and 150 metres wide. It was made of concrete and stone, half a million tonnes of it, more than the weight of the Empire State Building, and faced originally with marble. The Colosseum required 100,000 cubic metres of travertine, a limestone that comes from about 17 kilometres to the northeast of Rome, from a place called Tivoli. And this would have been brought by water down the Anio and into the Tiber and then landed uh, on the docks, perhaps the other side of the Palatine. It then had to be brought by cart 
through the streets. And that's just one of the many materials that went into building the Colosseum. The Colosseum consists of several stories of arched entrances and windows, enclosing an arena which is some 75 metres by 50 and would have contained seating for 50,000 spectators. The seats were carefully numbered and were allocated according to rank. Senators sat in the first tier, citizens in the second, the common men in the third, and women who were not members of important families had to share the fourth tier with the men whose job it was to hold in place the giant awning which once covered the arena protecting the spectators from the sun. When Titus dedicated the Colosseum in 81 AD, he celebrated by paying for entertainments. 9,000 animals, 5,000 of them wild species such as lions, bears, tigers, and even rhinoceroses were slaughtered in gladiatorial contests. Well, the Colosseum is often in popular view um, uh, merely a place for, for rather bloodthirsty entertainment, but it is, a, it is important to remember that um, uh, the very uh, organisation of these gladiatorial shows, um, animal, wild animal hunts, had a very serious religious um, function. The origins uh, go back into the Republican period in Rome. Um, gladiatorial games were held on the occasion of um, important funerals or funerals of important men and uh, continued throughout the, the rest of the imperial period to be held, um, especially on the occasion of um, imperial uh, funerals. Private individuals could, if they were very wealthy, also organise um, gladiatorial games as part of uh, funeral celebrations. But um, the Colosseum would be used principally for one major festival in December, which was the point at which the magistrates of the city changed over. It's the whole yearly cycle of um, political and uh, religious existence in the city that um, the incoming magistrates would pay for a set of games in the Colosseum. And the ritual itself uh, was thought to be both um, hardening, as it were, it was meant. To, it was a shocking experience to see um, people killed, but it was meant to be bound up with the idea that Roman society as a whole required that sort of ability to confront death. An interesting and surprising detail of these games is that they seem to have involved female gladiators. When the Roman writer Martial wrote a book celebrating the games, he noted that noble tradition tells how Hercules slew the lion in the wastes of the Nemean Valley. Let the ancient tale be reduced to silence. After your show, Caesar, we can say that we have seen such deeds performed by a woman's hand. There is, however, no evidence that the Colosseum was ever the venue for the sacrifice of Christians to the lions. Today, the underground passages where animals were caged are exposed to the air. Originally, a wooden floor would have lain over these, which would have been covered with sand to resemble solid ground and to soak up the blood. There is a saying that when the Colosseum falls, then so will Rome. Despite the ravages of time and of looters for its marble, the great amphitheatre still gives an impression of solidity and of endurance. But perhaps the old saying is behind the several attempts, one still being contemplated today, to restore it to its ancient glory. Most of what remains on the Palatine Hill dates from much later than the ancient period. Indeed, today, the 16th century villa of the Farnese family, with its fountains, grottos and gardens, must be negotiated before the older ruins can be reached. But even these date from the later Republic, or early Empire, rather than from the earlier time before 509 BC, 
when Rome suffered the tyranny of kings. The Palatine Hill was the site of imperial residences. Indeed, the word palace is derived from it. However, there is little left and nothing which could be called palatial. Time has not been merciful to the buildings which once housed the most powerful men in the world. The earliest traces of settlement uh, on the site of Rome um, have been found on the Palatine Hill, which the Romans themselves thought of as being the initial focus of settlement. The Palatine Hill is the one closest to the river. It's very uh, naturally defensible. And up there on the top, excavations uh, have found the post holes of a series of huts dating from the 9th to the 8th century BC. Um, the huts would have been quite large. They're, um, they're about eight meters by four meters. Um, so a sizable hall. Um, walled with wood and bottle and daub um, and thatched with uh, reeds. But the Romans themselves, interestingly, in their later tradition, they actually preserved one of these huts as a monument to the, what they saw as the original settlement on the Palatine, that even in the 4th century AD, tourists to Rome could go and see um, the hut of Romulus, as they called it. Ironically, it's not the house of a man which has survived best but that of a woman. The Casa de Livia, or the House of Livia, named after the infamous and powerful wife of Rome's first emperor in the first century BC, lies just behind the unexcavated palace of her son Tiberius, who became the second emperor. In Roman society, women had very few rights and were considered to be second-class citizens. Even women of imperial birth were not officially allowed much responsibility but unofficially, they sometimes wielded an influence which was the next best thing to direct power. It was a feature of the time to marry for status, to marry people from the right background, uh, to marry to give you a sort of alliance. But uh, these alliances shifted. It's interesting to see how Caesar marries and then remarries. There's that extraordinary but very telling moment when he divorces Pompeia because of her involvement in a scandal over the Bona Dea, a scandal with Clodius, and says Caesar's wife should be above suspicion. And that seems very strange to us. Wouldn't have seemed at all strange in the Roman world where reputation mattered so much. Livia was thought to have been a schemer and to have employed guile, cunning, and even poison in her attempts to secure the future of her son. Her husband Augustus, who ruled for 41 years from 27 BC to 14 AD, was known for his skill as an administrator and for his peaceful tenure, which saw the beginning of the Pax Romana, in which the Roman Empire was at its most secure, and which lasted for several decades at the end of the first century BC and the beginning of the first century AD. Real change came about in the transition from republic to empire. Augustus himself, following a long period, remember, of civil war when very little building was brought to fruition, instigated a whole new program of civic reconstruction. He was rebuilding the state morally, politically, but also physically. A very famous quote from the biographer Suetonius that Augustus had boasted he found Rome a city of brick, that is mud brick, and left it a city of marble. He was very consciously rebuilding a city to fit the image of the capital of the world. The Jewish-Egyptian historian Philo commented in 38 AD that the whole human race would have been destroyed had it not been for one man, Augustus, who ended wars, set every city at liberty, civilized all unfriendly, savage tribes, and safeguarded peace. But as Tacitus pointed out in 110 AD, he also slowly eroded the power of the Senate, bringing to the role of emperor the powers of an autocrat. This laid the path for the tyrannies which were to follow him. Everybody had an agenda. 
Pompey's agenda was to get land for his troops. Caesar's agenda was to try and get a decent province rather than the woods and glens of Italy. And Crassus's agenda was to get a command, get a glory to establish himself as a frontline figure in, in Rome. The Senate's agenda, or their opponents in the Senate's agenda, was to stop them. There was this perpetual struggle to prevent any individual from getting too big. Augustus was also a great patron of the arts. Virgil, Horace and Ovid all flourished under his patronage, although the last of these eventually fell from favour and was finally exiled. Virgil's great masterpiece, the Aeneid, was dedicated to the emperor, who, like the poem's hero Aeneas, was said to be descended from the goddess Venus. Aeneas was also the founder of the Roman people, and Virgil intended his characterization to embody the qualities of purposefulness and service which he knew Augustus valued. The other change that Augustus brought out was that after his reign, only the emperors were able to build temples or other major public structures. If you think about the famous buildings, they are the Forum of Augustus, the Forum of Trajan, the Baths of Caracalla, all of these major buildings are named after the emperors. Or the temples, their rebuildings, the Temple of Castrum Pollux, Temple of Antoninus and Faustina, the Pantheon itself, are all buildings built by, for the emperors. No other individual leaves his name on a building after the time of Augustus. It was a very rigid career structure at Rome. You did take the offices at particular ages or as soon after those particular ages as, as you could. But a lot of the game was, I suppose, to use those offices and then the generalships and the governorships that came after them to win as much fame, as much glory as possible. It's I suppose almost a, a sort of fame equivalent of a free market economy almost, the assumption that in a free market economy people will try and get as much money as possible, will try and maximise their own profit and the state will benefit. At Rome you try to get as much fame and glory along the way as you, as you could and the state would benefit from that as well. The forum was the focus uh, of uh, not only most um, civic aspirations in the city of Rome itself, but it also um, pretty soon reflected imperial ambitions as well. What we see now is largely the product of one uh, man's ambitions in particular, and that's Julius Caesar in the middle of the first century BC, and his successor, the uh, first Roman emperor, Augustus, because in typical Roman way, uh, power was expressed in terms of building, public building, and they took over Rome's political center, the Forum, and transformed it into their, uh, a monument to their own power. The Great Basilica Julia was built, the Porticus of Gaius and Lucius, uh, the, what we call the Basilica Pauli, Emilia, um, the um, Temple of Castor and Pollux uh, was uh, um, rebuilt, and um, even more importantly, under Augustus, um, a great temple of uh, deified Julius Caesar uh, his own adoptive father, uh, was set up at one end of the forum, uh, matched by a great temple of imperial harmony at the opposite end of the forum. Uh, a new senate house was built, uh, a new orator's platform was built. Um, it became essentially a sort of dynastic monument to the Roman emperors and the basis on which they claimed power. Augustus's stepson, Tiberius, became emperor in AD 14 and was, by all accounts, equally as effective as chief administrator. His image was fatally tarnished, however, by the fact that he misused the power which Augustus had brought to the position of emperor in pursuit of more selfish ends. Most sensationally, he's believed to have indulged in bizarre lusts and habituated a holiday palace on the island of Capri which became notorious as a site for his sexual experimentation. This, along with his awkward and pimply appearance and his propensity for drunkenness, did not make him popular, 
and his death in 37 AD was greeted by cries of throw Tiberius in the Tiber. It was during his reign that in the Roman province of Judea, the leader of the Jewish cult, Joshua ben Joseph, was executed by crucifixion. Tiberius probably never heard of the man, called Jesus the Christ in Greek. And even if he had, would not have imagined that eventually his cult would become the dominant religion of the Roman people, after the great Jupiter and Neptune and all the other pagan gods had begun to be forgotten. The site of his mother's house is relatively small and simple next to the sprawling magnificence of the palace of Domitian, which dates from the end of the first century AD. Domitian was perhaps the cruelest of Rome's tyrannical emperors and was responsible for the most bloody of the persecutions of the Christians. It is perhaps apt that he came to one of the bloodiest ends to befall a Roman emperor when he was murdered by an ex-slave in 96 AD. During the last uh, three centuries BC, the, the Forum gradually got more and more architecturally enhanced, as they say, that um, uh, as Rome took over the rest of the Mediterranean, and particularly the Eastern Mediterranean and all the Greek cities, they imported back to Rome the models that they could see out there, this uh, marvellous public architecture in stone. And the Roman Forum was one of the major focuses uh, of um, this new imported architecture. And they built great basilicas and porticuses, and the temples got rebuilt, and everything got ever more uh, luxury uh, architecture. All of these sacred buildings lie along what was called the Via Sacra. Nearby, on the Forum, was the site of the Temple of Castor and Pollux, the twin gods credited with fighting on the side of the Romans in their battles against the Latins in the 5th century BC. The temple was dedicated to them in the 5th century BC, but the six Corinthian columns which remain are from 6 AD. The splendid entablature which surmounts it is, however, an addition dating from the time of the mighty Augustus. Further along the road, the much younger Temple of Julius Caesar has fared even less well. The temple where the mortal remains of the famous dictator were brought, where Rome's first great conqueror and empire builder was cremated, where he whose avowed aim was to outshine Alexander the Great was deified by his successor Augustus, is now no more than rubble. Well, the thing to remember particularly about Rome is that by the end of the first century BC with the first emperor Augustus, it was the largest city in the ancient world. Uh, it had well over a million people, perhaps very, very more than a million people. Um, it was at least twice the size of its nearest rival. Um, this made it a very special place and it makes, us, it, makes it a very remarkable archaeological site. Um, and it's a place where the, ro the, the emperors uh, essentially expressed every ambition <laughs> they ever had about their own power and about the power of the Roman Empire. Later temples remained places of worship long after the old gods and deified emperors to which they were first dedicated had been forgotten or ignored. On the Via Sacra stands the temple of the deified Antonius Pius and Faustina, which dates from 141 AD, but which, since the 11th century, has been a consecrated church, the Church of San Lorenzo in Miranda. Only the porch and frieze of the original temple remain. If a building could find another use, and most notably as a church, it stood a stronger chance of survival and a number of very important Roman buildings have been protected in this way.
Another such in the Forum is the Curia, which stands much as it was rebuilt in 283 AD. This was originally the meeting place of the Roman Senate, but owes its remarkably good condition to its conversion to use as a place of Christian worship. The senators were a body whose power and influence were linked to the magnanimity of whoever was emperor. Under Trajan, for instance, they were valued and used as counselors and as safeguards for the public good. But in the time of Caligula, Tiberius's disastrous successor, they were no more than puppets. It is said that Caligula even added his favorite horse to their number. Christianity became the dominant religion of the Romans only after it was adopted by an emperor in the 4th century. That emperor was Constantine. It may be that Constantine's worship of Christ was merely a development of his earlier devotion to the cult of the sun god. But legend has it that before the battle he fought against Maxentius over the Milvian Bridge in 312 AD, he had a dream in which he saw the sign of Christ. The battle he subsequently fought was successful and Maxentius was forced to abandon his position and was driven into the river Tiber. Whatever the manner of his conversion, it had real consequences for the Christians of the Roman Empire, who were recovering from one of the cruelest of their persecutions under Diocletian. The Basilica of Constantine dominates the east of the Forum. This massive structure, begun by Maxentius in about 306 AD, but finished by Constantine, was amongst the last great buildings to be constructed in Imperial Rome. The nave is thought to have reached a height of 40 meters. A whole new series of forums were built Subsequently, the old Roman Forum was not the only one for the whole of the later history of Rome. Um, and they, all of them, in their way, took their model from the uh, original Forum. These are the ones where um, all the great cer ceremonies of state would take place. Um, imperial funerals were, were staged, you name it, any sort of major expression of uh, political and social um, and religious activity in Rome still was focused predominantly um, or took place by way of the Forum. As the emperors conquered more territories, the, the, the great triumphal procession, for instance, which started on uh, beside the Tiber, down on the plain of the Field of Mars, uh, the God of War, proceeded up into the Forum, out of the Forum, and then back into the Forum on its way up to the Capitoline Hill. The Forum was integral to, um, to later Roman ceremony as much as it had been in the, uh, in the earliest days, uh, but it was transformed architecturally into an expression of uh, the, the great might of the Roman Empire. Looking down on the Forum from the Palatine Hill, as the imperial family would have done, its east entrance is marked by the Arch of Titus. Titus was emperor for just two years and was a man of dangerous charm and, like Tiberius and Nero before him, of strange lusts. Like Tiberius, but unlike Nero, he also seems to have been a good administrator and a skilled soldier. This latter quality is celebrated in his arch. This was originally erected in 81 AD to celebrate the capitulation of Jerusalem to imperial forces and is famous for its two reliefs, which inaugurated a type of illustration new to Roman sculpture. On one side can be seen Titus riding in his triumphant chariot. On the other, another part of the triumphal procession carries the booty off from the Temple of Jerusalem. Yeah. 
Looking outside the Forum, the Arch of Constantine can be seen. In marked contrast to the Arch of Titus, this one symbolizes the transition of Rome from pagan stronghold to center of Christianity. It was commissioned by the Senate in honor of the first Christian emperor. It's covered by old reliefs culled from older edifices, monuments to Hadrian, Trajan, and Marcus Aurelius. The friezes, which date from Constantine's own time, are feeble by comparison. The empire by this time was changing, and Rome's days as ruler of the world numbered. One of the greatest desecrations ever committed by a 20th century politician against an ancient legacy must have been that committed by Mussolini against the Fori Imperiali. This site contained the remains of forums built outside the main forum after the time of Julius Caesar, as the expansion of the empire called for more administrative activity at its center. These were covered by buildings in the Renaissance, but uncovered again in 1924 when Mussolini cleared the area in preparation for a wide avenue. The avenue would have given him the opportunity to hold military parades, which could employ the impressive Colosseum as a backdrop. He hoped, no doubt, that this would imply that the empire that he hoped to establish was one which would reflect that of Italy's ancient ancestors. Mussolini paved over much of the forums and proceeded with the building of his avenue, now a main route through the city and never free of traffic. Chief among the surviving treasures is Trajan's Column, which holds a set of narrative reliefs spiraling up it. These magnificent illustrations tell the story of Rome's wars against and eventual victory over Dacia, now modern Romania, in 106 AD. They're famed for the realism of their detail. Trajan, who ruled from 98 to 117 AD, was considered one of the good emperors and was famous for getting on well with his senators and for the diplomacy he showed in all his dealings. But the best preserved of the ancient treasures to be found in Rome lies a little way off from the Forum, the Palatine Hill and the Colosseum. Nestling in the narrow streets around the Piazza della Rotonda, the Pantheon is like a giant tree trunk which betrays its age through its exposed rings. Originally, this location would have been the campus marshes and would have been equally as crowded with offices, public baths and temples. Entering its domed interior would have been like stepping from chaos into serenity. This awesome building spans the centuries not as a dead relic but as a living building constantly maintained, constantly growing. It was built as a pagan temple by the Emperor Hadrian in 126 AD. Perhaps not surprisingly, because it is the best preserved of all Roman buildings anywhere in the Roman world, the Pantheon has been the subject of the debate ever since the, the Renaissance. It's particularly unsatisfying to trained architectural eyes because there seems to be a misfit between the porch, the part you go in through, and the circular domed interior. It's also enigmatic in terms of its function. 
Our literary sources, our ancient sources, hardly mentioned at all. It may have been dedicated to all the gods, hence Pantheon. It was also certainly used by Hadrian as an audience chamber. It's certainly not a temple in the normal Roman sense of the word. Because it's circular and domed, and because its light comes through this central part, it's also been invested with a certain cosmic significance. And a lot of debate is really concerned to what extent there is some sort of grand order in the design of the Pantheon. What's more interesting to me, of course, is that this was, until the 19th century, the largest single domed space anywhere. It's larger by a few feet than the Dome of St. Peter's in Rome and the Dome of Christopher Wren's St. Paul's in London. Pantheon is remarkable on many, many different uh, scores. Apart from being the largest uh, concrete dome in the Roman world, uh, it's uh, also the best surviving uh, Roman building we have. It's situated right in the middle of um, the uh, field of Mars. So the Pantheon, which looks out onto all this, uh, this space, would be the sort of place where the emperor could um, sit in state, surrounded by statues of the gods and his ancestors uh, in the niches all around the walls um, and the um, whole court. In the popular mind, Hadrian is best remembered for the wall which spans the ancient border between Britain and Caledonia, a practical rough brick structure along which Roman soldiers would patrol. Nothing could be more different than the Pantheon, truly Hadrian's great gift to the world. Originally, it was built by Agrippa in 27 BC. Hadrian had this structure demolished, however, and after building the redesigned Pantheon, remembered Agrippa's original building by carving his name across the new one's front. For centuries, this led to confusion over the identity of the Pantheon's architect and its date. It is a stunningly impressive structure today, despite missing the bronze which would have originally lined its roof. The bronze beams which had once supported the porch roof went to St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, requisitioned by Pope Urban VIII for Bernini's Baldugino. In medieval times, it was converted into a church, and later its porch became a marketplace where poultry and then fish were sold as late as 1845. But most importantly, it survived. Over the centuries, the ground level surrounding it has risen, so that when one comes across it, entering the square from the winding streets, it appears squat, short but very broad. It would not have done so at the time, of course, The dome span is larger than that of St. Peter's Basilica. Its oculus lets in just the right amount of light to give the interior an ethereal quality. At the rear can be seen friezes from the Basilica of Neptune which adjoins it, but elsewhere are Christian chapels and tombs. Italian kings are buried here and so are artists, including the great Renaissance painter Raphael. This building takes us vividly back to ancient Rome and shows us its best side, the tranquil opposite to the blood and guts entertainments held in the Colosseum, the center of calm in the midst of a bustling city and perhaps a site of reflection at the heart of an ever-growing, ever-warring empire. It is perhaps heartening that so many of Rome's archaeological treasures, the remnants of buildings erected by her great rulers, some who were good, but many who were bad, have survived. We in the West are fortunate to be able to claim this sophisticated civilization to be our own, offering up its tales of history and showing us the origins of our cultured and civilized world.
In the first century AD, the area around the Bay of Naples served as a holiday resort where the ancient Romans could either visit the town of Herculaneum on the coast or travel further inland to the town of Pompeii. The area, it seems, was used mainly by wealthy Romans. Pompeii itself had impressive civil buildings, sports arenas, theaters, and temples. In Herculaneum, villas lined the Bay of Naples decked out with fine furnishings. In their prime, these villas must have been an incredible sight. Today, the sad remains of these once thriving towns lie silent and mournful under the Italian sun. Pompeii and Herculaneum were destroyed by a huge natural disaster, a violent volcanic eruption which entombed both towns in ash and rock. But that same disaster has also preserved a unique picture of life in ancient Rome nearly 2,000 years ago. One of the great things about Pompeii, as well as being a, a superb archaeological story, it was also almost a terrific detective story as well, because there was so much we did know about Pompeii, but until this century there were also a great deal of unresolved mysteries. Pompeii was uh, founded on the end of a natural outcrop, uh, actually an old lava flow from Vesuvius, which came down um, very close to the mouth of a river which um, formed a natural bay on the Bay of Naples. And it would look as if the first uh, moves to, to settle Pompeii permanently uh, were taken in the 6th century BC. When a natural catastrophe strikes, it is often unexpected and brings with it terrible consequences. The unexpected eruption of Mount Vesuvius was one of the most violent natural disasters of all time. At noon, on August 24, A.D. 79, the peak of Vesuvius suddenly erupted. A horrifying crash shook the earth violently. As the crater split open, a column of ash, rock, and smoke was thrown over 15 miles up into the atmosphere. Daylight turned to darkness as the thick cloud mushroomed locking out the sun. At once, the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum were thrown into panic and confusion. It seems that only a few people died in the initial eruption. But the next day, thousands were entombed in Pompeii taken by surprise by the powerful, explosive flow of red-hot rock and ash. The red-hot ash and debris from the volcano, when it comes tumbling down the side of the mountain, is almost gelled together, so it becomes a kind of liquid, like a river. It flowed down, over the mountain, and through the city, and it was this that did this destruction in Pompeii. It had begun like any other summer's day. The sky was clear, and the sun shone brilliantly. The shimmering water of the Bay of Naples was calm and turquoise blue. The lush green slopes of Vesuvius provided the dramatic backdrop for the summer scene. People were going about their daily business, and the rich, safe town of Pompeii hummed with activity. Roman mythology suggested that volcanoes were gateways to the underworld, but the people who lived in the Bay of Naples region thought that Vesuvius was simply a large hill. Vesuvius had been silent for almost a thousand years. How could the population possibly know that a savage disaster was about to consume this thriving, prosperous, and apparently secure Roman town? Therefore, no one knew or recognized the significance of the warning signs. Over the previous few days, there had been some minor earth tremors. All local sources of water had dried up. 
As morning broke on August 24, A.D. 79, the weather was excellent. People moved on with the business of their daily lives. The market stalls were open. Tradesmen had removed the shutters from their shop fronts and were busy selling their merchandise. The bars served snacks and wine, and the bakers offered freshly baked bread. The doors of the public baths were open for business. Women filled jars with water from the public fountains. As the morning passed without event, families and friends gathered to eat lunch together. Then Vesuvius erupted. The huge explosion drew people out into the streets. As they stood aghast looking at the volcano, the burning rock, ash, and pumice poured out of the crater. The sun vanished, and Pompeii was plunged into darkness. Chaos broke out as people panicked and fled. For the next 12 hours, there was a constant heavy downfall of scorching pumice and ash. It buried Pompeii and Herculaneum under six feet of debris. The traditional explanation is that all those who died at Pompeii were buried under the fallout from the volcano. It was only after close studies of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens that the real truth about the fate of Pompeii became graphically clear. We owe our knowledge of the events that terrible day to two letters, which have survived for nearly 2,000 years. They were written to the historian Tacitus in A.D. 104 by Pliny the Younger. He was the nephew of Pliny the Elder, admiral of the Roman Mediterranean fleet, which was based at Mycenaeum to the north of Naples. Pliny's letters vividly describe the eruption and tell us how his uncle died on the beach at Stabiae. Pliny the Elder was a keen scientist and wished to see the results of the eruption at close hand. So he ordered a ship to be rowed across the bay, hoping to save as many people as possible. He left his nephew behind at Mycenae. The rough seas and falling rocks made it difficult to land so Pliny ordered the ship to row to Stabia, at the south of the bay. While trying to reach the shore, Pliny the Elder was overcome by poisonous fumes and died. At the time of the explosion, Pliny the Younger left us a very detailed record of the events. First of all, he describes the initial explosion, which we now know was probably the result of the pressure underneath the volcano. Uh, and what's very interesting is that he subsequently describes the collapse of the, the cloud of ash and smoke and how it sweeps over the landscape. Young Pliny tells us after several violent tremors, he feared that his house would collapse. He persuaded his mother that they should leave as the tremors continued. Next, he witnessed what would become known to science as a pyroclastic Low, in which he described an ominous thick smoke spreading over the earth like a flood which followed behind us. Pliny and his mother escaped into the fields but were surrounded by darkness. All they could hear were the screams and wails of the men, women, and children. When the daylight returned two days later, it revealed a chilling scene. Almost all the southern end of the bay had been buried. The whole center of Mount Vesuvius was blown out by the eruption. And where the sides had collapsed, a vast new crater had been created. The enormous cone of Vesuvius was now just a stump. The slopes of the volcano where lush woods, vineyards, olive groves, and villas once stood was now a wasteland. Earthquakes and tidal waves had destroyed buildings, 
and all the remains were covered in a thick layer of ash. Pompeii represents the ideal archaeological site. It is actually a, a, a complete assemblage um, of buildings and their contents and uh, all manner of references to uh, particular individuals within a known context, and that's really the appeal of Pompeii, with the added advantage even that it, it was actually stopped at a particular moment in time. At Pompeii, the tops of ruined buildings were the only visible reminder that it had ever existed. Soon, even these were taken to be used to build new shelters for the homeless. Mount Vesuvius remained active for another 1,300 years, until around 1,400, coating Pompeii with layer after layer of volcanic debris. The puzzle for scientists was always to explain why so many of the citizens died, and why the mangled bodies were found on top of the ash which filled the streets and not buried beneath. After all, the people could simply have fled indoors to avoid the falling rocks, and most would have survived. Lava from volcanoes flows slowly, and it is fairly easy to avoid. So it could not have been that which killed the inhabitants. Recently, scientists have discovered that what actually killed them was a sudden and violent torrent of burning hot rock and ash which flowed over Pompeii. That's why we find that a lot of the bodies are actually on top of the preliminary ash and rock from the first eruption, because when that was thrown into the air and rained down on Pompeii, it was fairly easy to avoid that. All they had to do, really, was to go indoors to avoid the fallen ash. But when people on the second day were hit in the streets, that's when the bulk of the people were killed. That's why we find so many bodies that have been dismembered and mangled in such a severe way. About 5,000 people died at Pompeii, one-fourth of its estimated population. The survivors probably fled on the first day of the eruption. Those who remained behind were sealed in with the rest of the town, like a time capsule. Ash and rock surrounded their remains. Soil concealed the site, and plants and shrubs and trees grew among the ash. At the time of the eruption, the citizens of Pompeii enjoyed an era of thriving development and peace. By AD 79, the town had become a prosperous commercial center with an industrious, creative, and growing population. The prosperity of the town is reflected in the splendid public buildings. The Forum was the religious, political, and economic center of the Roman resort. Market stalls stood along covered doorways where customers haggled over goods. At the south end of the Forum were the council offices and the law courts. The north end was dominated by the temples of Jupiter, Loris, and Vespasian. The wool and cloth markets, the main market, the Fuller's building of Eumatia, and the office of weights and measures formed the commercial center of the forum. Nearby were other public buildings, including a sports ground, the Temple of Isis, and the Temple of Jupiter Malachiosis. In the area near a second sports ground was the vast amphitheater. Uh, one of the most interesting um, aspects of Roman civilization is this fact of living in cities and the nature of Roman towns. And Pompeii has a theater, an amphitheater, a uh, basilica. It has all the features of, uh, of, uh, that make up the, the, the sort of model Roman town. The public baths were built on main roads. These formed an essential part of daily life. Some roads had a more commercial nature, with shops and taverns. Also, a semi-rural area with vineyards and gardens survived in the center of the town. Almost all of the remaining areas of the town were residential. Rooms facing the street could be let out as shops or taverns. Sometimes whole houses were transformed into laundries, bakeries, or small factories. Rich and poor, families and businesses lived and worked in very close proximity. 
Estates on the fertile slopes of Vesuvius grew grapes, olives, cereal, vegetables, and animal food, or reared animals. Pompeii needed its own market garden to keep up supplies of food. Pompeii's other main industries were the production of wine and woolen cloth. Many Pompeians made their living either manufacturing items for export or importing other items from abroad. Some agricultural produce, such as wine and olive oil, was exported as far as North Africa, while pottery was imported from southern France. Thanks to Pompeii's thriving seaport, sea traders operated a complex network of contacts with the Orient, Africa, and Asia. From the moment of its foundation uh, to the moment of, of its destruction, its primary function as a city was as a port for the um, area. This is one reason actually why uh, Pompeii was probably not rebuilt after the eruption. It could have been salvaged. It wasn't that deeply buried, but it's very possible that its harbour, that its port, its actual raison d'etre, was destroyed in the eruption. The people of Pompeii seem to have found a great deal of time for leisure, rest, and relaxation. The town certainly had a variety of activities on offer. The great theater showed comedies and tragedies to spectators, who were protected from the sun by covers and sprinkled with scented water. The second main venue was the Odeon, which was used for concerts, poetry recitals, and lectures. The enormous amphitheater held the games and had a capacity of 20,000 people who took their places according to a strict social hierarchy. The games included such spectacles as gladiator fights, animal duels or hunts, and possibly chariot racing. The gladiators were incredibly popular. They lived and trained in the nearby barracks. 63 people died there in the eruption. In their duels, most gladiators were killed on their first appearance. Those who survived won respect, freedom, and wealth. In the centuries following the eruption, people slowly returned to live in the area, establishing new towns and villages. But Pompeii's time capsule was to remain undiscovered until the 18th century. One of the most famous sites of Pompeii are the plaster cast bodies. These are not actual bodies. They are made from the molds of impressions left by bodies buried in the ash. This process reveals an astonishing amount of detail, clothes, shoes, and facial expressions. These terrified and tortured faces of those who died in the eruption have been preserved for almost 2,000 years. The reason for the excavations at Pompeii was that archaeologists and historians could use the discoveries to piece together a picture of the town, the townspeople, and life in the Roman Empire. So, why did the tragedy strike Pompeii? Could the town's death have been avoided? Vesuvius lies on the fault line that also includes the nearby volcanoes Etna and Stromboli. Depending on the activity of these plates, a volcano can lie dormant for many years. Volcanoes occur at weak points in the earth crust where the pressure of, of the molten rock beneath forces its way through the surface. In most instances, volcanic eruptions are relatively harmless because lava moves very slowly and people generally have time to avoid it. Where it gets dangerous is where there's a pressure beneath the Earth's surface, which results uh, in, a, in effectively a huge explosion, and that's what's happened at Pompeii. 
Prior to AD 79, Vesuvius had been totally inactive for almost a thousand years. But inside the earth, the pressure grew, and molten rock, known as magma, collected in the volcano's chamber. Eruptions occur when the pressure under the plate is strong enough to force the magma through weak spots in the Earth's crust. When this magma reaches the surface, its path may be free, in which case it would flow slowly down the sides of a mountain. Or it may be blocked, in which case there can be a huge eruption. The eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79 showed the consequences of such a blockage. When dormant, magma deposits in the crater and shaft may cool and solidify, forming a plug. If the magma cannot escape, the pressure eventually smashes and explodes the plug out, blasting ash and rock fragments thousands of meters into the air. This is what happened in Pompeii. There were warnings that would have alerted modern scientists. Earth tremors and the natural sources of water running dry due to the rise in ground temperature are just two clues which warn of an eruption. But how were the residents of Pompeii in AD 79 to know the significance of these things? It was when Mount St. Helens in Washington erupted in 1980 that the answers to these mysteries were revealed. As the scientists watched from a safe distance, they witnessed a previously unknown phenomenon. As the sides of the volcano exploded, a wave of rock and ash spewed out of the crater. Like the flood that Pliny the Younger had written of after AD 79, it traveled at 100 miles an hour at a temperature of 200 degrees centigrade, scorching and smashing everything in its path. For those that had pondered the fate of Pompeii, all the pieces fell into place. Today at Pompeii, much of the site remains unexcavated. Archaeologists now use modern technology and equipment to sift the remains for the last clues to the past. Preservation and conservation experts work on mosaics and paintings, protecting them from the weather and restoring them to their best condition. Under the ash, Pompeii had been safe, but the wind, rain, eruptions, and earthquakes have continued the destruction of the town. Preserving the uncovered ruins is just as vital as continuing the excavations. Pompeii, unfortunately, is a ruin, and uh, just like any ruin, um, it's likely to become more ruinous the more uh, time it spends exposed to even quite normal weathering. The problem with the modern environment that is also full of pollutants. The other thing is that tourists themselves are quite a, a challenge to the, to the structure of the town. The numbers of people who walk through the remains each uh, year uh, which run into their hundreds of thousands, can also bring a considerable amount of damage with them. It is a major task to protect Pompeii so that future generations have the benefit of learning about the town and of life in the Roman Empire. It is also important that these future generations learn about the death of Pompeii. The busy Italian city of Naples lies in the shadow of Vesuvius. But the volcano has been silent for over 50 years. But, as Pompeii proves, this does not mean it is not active. Naples today is densely populated. The weather and work are good. People are happy and getting on with their daily business. It is a modern day reflection of Pompeii. And just as vulnerable. The ruins of the magnificent capital of the Aztecs today lie near the Cathedral of Mexico City. In the 15th and 16th centuries, this great temple was the seat of both religion and politics of the mighty warlike Aztec people. Subject and allied cities would visit the temple regularly. 
The Aztec's god, Huitzilopochtli, had promised his people a place where they would be the masters of a huge empire. In order to recognize this place, they had to find an eagle perched on a cactus, holding a serpent in its beak. They would then know that this was to be the special place where they would be lords and where their great capital, Tenochtitlan, would be built. Today, this site is known as Mexico City. The Mexico of the modern world looks with pride upon the symbols of its ancient past. The colors of the Mexican flag, green, white, and red, display at the center the eagle perched upon a cactus. The great temple of the Aztecs was originally a humble temple built in honor of both their god, Huitzilopochtli, and Chaloc, god of rain. But as the Aztec nation grew in importance and wealth, the building became more impressive, painted in bright colors, erected in what was considered to be the center of the mighty Aztec empire. of Aztec civilization reach deep into the past. Long before the birth of Christ, an Aztec culture was already emerging. A hieroglyphic writing had been developed, and their astronomers had begun to use the 52-year calendric cycle which formed the basis of Aztec religion. Even at this early date, the ritual ball game, which became infamous throughout Mesoamerica, was being played. Long before the Aztecs appeared, the central part of Mexico was dominated by the city of Teotihuacan, only 45 kilometers away from the site which was later to become the Aztec capital. Teotihuacan was a great city, the sixth largest city in the world at that time, 600 AD. It remains one of the most impressive sites of the ancient world. It covered more than 13 square kilometers. At its center was an area of palaces and flat-topped pyramids, of which the so-called pyramids of the sun and moon are particularly outstanding. Extending the length of the city was the road known now as the Street of the Dead, which was more than five kilometers long. As Francisco Zapita Alvarez explains, which thus was the most important avenue here at Teotihuacan because uh, a lot of people from other areas, uh, the Totonacos, possible uh, Zapotecs and uh, 
some Aztecs came to this area to offer presents to the gods. The first constructions, uh, the monumental constructions, uh, we think which was built during the first century after Jesus Christ, see? Uh, we think which the first uh, temple built it was the uh, temple of the sun, then the temple of the moon, and they built the street of the dead. The population here, we think which was around 120,000 people. Various buildings depict gods and goddesses who would later be worshipped in Aztec times. Teotihuacan illustrate the importance of religion. Water, earth, and sea life are often represented. Ruben Cabrera, a Mexican archaeologist who has worked at Teotihuacan since 1980, explains the paintings in a palace built close to the site. Este es el conjunto que le llaman Patio Blanco de Atetelco. Fue explorado en 1947 por el arqueólogo Carlos Margain y eh, representa el complejo de tres templos característico de Teotihuacán en su disposición urbana, en su planeación, ya que estos eh, se ubican hacia el norte, hacia el este y hacia el sur, según los cuatro puntos cardinales. Representan dos temas fundamentalmente. Aluden al sacrificio humano y también hablan de la guerra, de la aspecto, del aspecto bélico. Como vemos, hay una procesión de dos deidades, jaguares y coyotes. Pero ambos, ambas, eh, ambos personajes llevan simbólicamente devorando un corazón sangrante. Y eh, de este lado son los, eh, es la procesión únicamente de coyotes, pero también llevan la, len, la lengua, la, la, la vírgula de la palabra. Y hay una serie de otros motivos que, que están aludiendo a puntas de proyectil, eh, macanas, eh, eh, que están hablando de la, de la guerra. Esos son los temas más importantes. Eh, Enmarcan a, a los temas principales una serie de eh, otros elementos simbólicos que en un momento más temprano fue de mucha importancia, como la serpiente, pero que para esta época, hacia los 450, 500 de nuestra era, ya no era tan importante la serpiente, sino el jaguar fundamentalmente. A remarkable stylistic feature of the Teotihuacan murals is their symbolistic complexity. What is interesting is the repetition of images throughout the temples, giving us an insight into religious practices and thoughts. In about 650 AD, Teotihuacan was overthrown, but remained as an important religious center, as it was believed that the gods had assembled there to create the sun. Moctezuma, the last Aztec ruler made frequent pilgrimages to this site.
The Aztecs also held dear to themselves the traditions passed down to them by their predecessors, the Toltecs, whose achievements were attributed to Quetzalcoatl, their great priest ruler. Shortly before 1200 AD, the Toltec state collapsed, and the Valley of Mexico became home to a succession of half-civilized tribes known collectively as Chichimex. The last of the barbarian tribes to enter the Valley of Mexico was the Nahuatl-speaking group which we now know as the Aztecs, although they refer to themselves as the Mexica, or the Tenocha. Today, all that we know about the early days of the Aztecs has been passed down to us in the form of legends. It is rumored that the early Aztecs discovered the god Huitzilopochtli in a cave on a hillside. They then began a journey on his command to his birthplace at Coatepec, building temples in his honor whenever they stopped. The birth of Huitzilopochtli, the war god, is important, as he was considered to be a manifestation of the sun. To them, he represented the sun's eternal fight against the powers of darkness, a never-ending struggle reenacted daily. Just as Huitzilopochtli was born to combat his brother and sister, so the sun rises each morning to do fresh battle with the stars and moon and put them to flight. To help Huitzilopochtli as the sun in his daily struggle, it was necessary for man to provide the god with the most precious food that he can offer, his own blood. As Dr. Elizabeth Baquedano explains, we know about human sacrifice thanks to the descriptions of the 16th century friars who kept very meticulously records about human sacrifice. The most important friar who recorded everything he saw in terms of religion was Bernardino de Sahagún, who came to Mexico in 1539. We know that human sacrifice was important to keep the universe in equilibrium, but also we know that human sacrifice was the most precious offer we had to give to the gods. Children were also sacrificed. There were three paradises to which the souls of the victims went to. So the God of Rain had special sacrifices as well, but the method of disposal of the body varied. So on the left hand side we find decapitation. We have several offerings containing decapitated heads. We find decapitated individuals, both male, female and children. But on the side of Tlaloc we usually have children. The children cried before human sacrifice took place. And the more they cry, the better the omen for rain. The more rains, the better uh, the season would be. Sacrifice was of paramount importance to the Aztecs. For without the nourishment of human hearts and blood, it was thought that the sun would stop moving. The heads of the sacrificial victims were displayed in skull racks. These were architectural platforms, carved on all sides, seen here at the great temple of the Aztecs, where 240 different skulls are painted with stucco. They were horrific monuments which celebrated success in battle and intimidated their enemies. 
the tradition of having skull racks dates to about 700 or 800 AD in Mexico, in the state of Oaxaca, uh, at the site called La Coyotera. But the Aztecs actually made it their own. You find skull racks depicted in um, the chroniclers of the 16th century. They even the heads of the Spaniards were displayed and we have manuscripts showing the heads, the severed heads of, of the Spaniards, including horse heads, because the natives had not seen horses before. This particular example conveys ideas of fame, glory, prestige and power. Um, although this example is a sculpted one, real skull racks were placed next to the temples. The temples had um, real heads, the flesh decayed, and the skull actually stayed behind. The hearts of the sacrificial victims were placed in vessels called kuaushikali, eagle vessels. The great temple of the Aztecs was considered to be the center of their universe, and a bustling city soon grew around its steps. Avenues were built in a highly planned grid formation, and at its heyday, the city of Tenochtitlan was known to have over 200,000 inhabitants. Until recently, most of the great temple was known to us only through documentary sources. In 1978, a Mexican archaeologist and his colleagues unearthed the remains of the temple itself and caused a massive resurgence of interest in the Aztec civilization. The first has disappeared, but the second dates back to 1390, which is the one we see today virtually complete. The later constructions were enclosed within successively larger buildings. These pyramids are dedicated to both the tribal god, Huitzilopochtli, the sun god, and to the rain god, Chalak. The temple represented the mythical place of Huitzilopochtli's birth, Coatepec, a serpent mountain, which is why the site is surrounded by walls representing snakes. The Great Temple was as tall as the present-day Cathedral of Mexico City. And it was here that thousands of human sacrifices were made. Behind us is the Great Temple of the Aztecs. The left-hand side is the Temple of Huitzilopochtli, the tribal god of the Aztecs, the god of war. On the right-hand side, you have the Temple of Tlaloc, the god of rain. Both are of equal importance, of same size, of same dimensions. Both share the main precinct at the Great Temple. The Temple of Huitzilopochtli is recognized by the sacrificial stone called Texcatl in Nahuatl, the language spoken by the Aztecs. The sacrificial stone here is important because at major festivals and rituals, human sacrifice took place. On the other side, at the entrance to the temple dedicated to Chalak, god of rain, 
is a sculpture of a reclining man holding a vessel on his stomach. The sculpture is known as Shakmul, a divine messenger between the priests and the gods. It was here that human hearts and blood were placed as offerings. Both shrines were originally decorated inside and out. We can still see pillars with paintings symbolizing the god of rain. A band of goggle eyes, typical of Chalak, painted in black on a white background. Below these eyes is a horizontal band painted in blue, followed by two red bands. According to archaeologists, the lower part of the pillars area was painted with black and white vertical bands, which may represent rain. Little can be said about the third construction stage of the Great Temple, except that during the excavations, archaeologists found eight life-size sculptures representing standard bearers leaning against the steps leading to the temple of Huitzilopochtli. A staggering 6,000 objects were excavated at the temple. Many of the tribute objects came from different parts of the empire. These offerings include a large number of objects associated with chalak, such as fish, shell, and coral. There are also several skeletal remains of children and adults dedicated to their warrior god. Offerings containing fish from the Gulf Coast coral, and shells can still be seen along with effigies of the god of fire, Shutakutli. Incense and artifacts of many sorts from all over Mesoamerica. and the ancient Mexican peoples wrote their books in bark paper. We find this type of material still being produced in the state of Guerrero in Mexico. It's very much painted in the traditional style, hand-painted. These manuscripts were called codices and we have 14 pre-Columbian codices nowadays. We have another excellent example called Codex Mendocino or Codex Mendoza. This manuscript was first put together by the first viceroy of New Spain, Don Antonio de Mendoza, in the colonial period. It's particularly important because it illustrates three aspects of Mexican history. The first section deals with the history of the Aztec rulers, from the first Aztec ruler to the last. The second section deals with the tribute, how tribute was paid to the Aztecs, how much, how often, and in what form. The third section of the manuscript deals with aspects of education for the children. You will find that the parents were scolding the children, sometimes bringing them close to a fire of chilies, so that the children inhale the chili smell and got a bit of a cough. Sometimes the Aztecs force the children to sleep outside, to sleep in mud, in wet mud. There are other aspects as well, as for instance, how many tortillas were children allowed to eat a day, depending on the age. The boys were usually trained the arts or the crafts of the father. Well, the girls stayed with mother at home. Sometimes the girls 
were taught how to cook, how to weave, and this codex is particularly useful to reconstruct how the Aztecs lived, how they brought the new babies home, the uh, function of the midwife, what they did when a baby was born, how they announced the birth of a baby boy or a baby girl. The Aztec rulers of Tenochtitlan became part of a triple alliance with rulers of nearby states. Netzahuacotl was a great ruler of neighboring Texcoco, who ruled from 1418 to 1472. He was contemporary with the Aztec ruler Moctezuma. He favored law, engineering, and the arts, and made Texcoco the seat of the highest court and the center of artistic activity. He encouraged the construction of an extensive system of aqueducts to bring water from mountain springs to the towns and agricultural terraces of the foothills. Netzuacoyotl's great palace is not visible nowadays, but his pleasure gardens on the nearby hill of Tetzcoatzingo offer traces from the past. The hill once stood within the view of the lake, and though the water has retreated, the view remains impressive. Here, in the 1430s, Netzuacoyotl collected a zoo of strange animals, perhaps the first in the New World, and a garden of unusual plants. An aqueduct carried water from the mountains into a reservoir ornamented with bas reliefs, and from there it flowed by streams and canals all over the garden, filling the lakes and the bathing pool cut into the living rock. He built elaborate stairways in rock. Sitting in Netzuakotl's stone throne on the hilltop, one gets a magnificent view of his royal vantage. The king must have watched the traffic of the fishing boats below him, though now the lake has given way to farms as he listened to the sounds of crowing roosters and birdsong. The remains of the basins can be seen, but there are no waterfalls, bird cages, and flower beds, which gave the king such delight. An Aztec water system can still be seen at Xochimilco, which in Duatl means place of the fields of flowers. Today, it is a bustling tourist attraction where vendors display their goods from brightly colored barges, much as they did in yesteryears. One of the most important forms of cultivation in the Valley of Mexico was Xenampa agriculture, a form of intensive cultivation on segments of land artificially constructed in lakes. Properly maintained, they can produce several crops a year and will remain fertile for centuries without having to lie fallow. Xochimilco 
is the area called the floating gardens by tourists. So Chimilco is known because of the Aztec canals. The Aztecs used to travel and used to sell their products alongside the canals. The canals went as far as Tenochtitlan, the present great temple of the Aztecs, was part of the lake shore of Texcoco. This area had two types of water, fresh water as well as salt water. During Moctezuma's reign, during the rulership of Moctezuma and Netzahualcoyotl, they decided to build a dam to divide the salt water from the fresh water. This was a very important aqueduct which divided the water for people to drink as well as to cultivate the land. The land is very fertile. People used to get three crops and it even yielded as far as four crops sometimes a year. They cultivated maize, amaranth, and they also cultivated different flowers. It's still the richest area in Mexico City where people buy and sell flowers. The area is rich because People can live on water as well as in Aztec times, people depended on hunting as well as fishing. People trapped birds and fish with their nets and harpoons, but they could also get frogs, eggs, larvae, and all kinds of insects that were edible. People depended upon maize cultivation, and maize was and is still the staple food in Mexico. Many dishes were derived from maize, such as tortillas, tamales, envelopes of steamed maize stuffed with savory vegetables or meat, and atole, a sort of porridge. Canoe traffic linked the entire lake system of the Valley of Mexico. The flow was predominantly into Tenochtitlan and consisted largely of foodstuffs and other provisions. Not only was canoe transport more efficient, but in many instances the water route was shorter than the land routes. Another important crop is the agave or maguey cactus. The plant was a source of fiber for clothing, netting, ropes and bags. The spines were used as needles, as Tommaso Antonio explains. The popular name of the plant is maguey, and its botanical name is agave. At this age, we must cut the leaves from the middle of the plant, because when the maguey blooms, the maguey dies. See, so before the blooming, we'll cut the leaves, and then with this kind of round knife, we'll scratch the heart of the plant every day to irritate it, and then the maguey will produce a liquid, which is very sweet, and so we call it honey water. Then the honey water is taken off by soaking out with this kind of gourd, it's a local gourd, which we call a cocote. With this a cocote, we soak out the juice, the honey water so, the honey water, see? Then this honey water, we'll drink it so, or we'll put it into wood barrels, and we let it ferment for 24 hours. 24 hours later, the honey water will turn to a liquor, a pre, a pre columbian liquor, which is called a pulque. The pulque will contain a 6% of alcohol, like beer, for instance. And the maguey produces the honey water during six months. It produces a gallon a day, half gallon in the morning and a half in the afternoon. And out of the leaves, out of the maguey leaves, the ancient cultures, they got also the first paper that they used to write on. They got the parchment paper. Mm -hmm. See? I should write, I'll write something, for you'll see it is a writing paper. Mm -hmm. Look, from each leaf, the ancient cultures, they got the parchment paper. They got one sheet inside. Look, it was the first paper that the ancient culture used to make the, the codices. Mm -hmm. And the parchment is strong. There is one inside and another outside. Mm -hmm. 
we obtained two sheets from each leaf. And under the outside parchment paper, they discover also the first soap, the first soap that the ancient cultures used for washing. This is the pre-Columbian soap. And the point of the leaf was also very useful, either as an arrowhead, or they discover also the first needle and thread. The first needle already threaded, because out of the fibers they weave, they made clothing out of these fibers. Mm -hmm. Look, they got the needle and thread in one piece. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Mm -hmm. Needle and thread together. Mm -hmm. And for the dyeing, to put color on the fibers, they use it also natural colors. For instance, with a rose leaf, they got instant permanent dyeing. Mm -hmm. Look at it. And the color won't wash out, the color stays. When the first Spanish moored off the coast of Mexico in 1517, their initial intentions had been to secure further lands for the Spanish crown and to spread the word of God. It was Cortes, one of the early conquistadors, who, fueled by tales of riches and gold, embarked on an arduous journey to the interior to find the legendary Aztec capital, controlled at the time by the mighty ruler Moctezuma. Cortes was an educated man who was trained as a lawyer in Salamanca. So he was not an ignorant person like Pizarro was for the case of South America. Cortes was also a good diplomat. He was the perfect Machiavellian who could play tricks on politicians. En route, their treatment of the local tribes was often brutal and suppressive. But to the Spanish, their actions were justified with the secure knowledge that God Almighty was on their side and that conversions to the Christian faith were being made with religious fervor. Cortes met with the enemies of Moctezuma and convinced them to join him in his move on Tenochtitlan. The most powerful of these were the Tlaxcalans, who had reached a peaceful agreement with the Spanish following a series of standstill battles and had agreed to help the Spanish defeat the mighty Aztec rulers. The two leaders finally met face to face for the first time. Moctezuma, however, believing Cortes and his party to be gods, welcomed the Spaniards into his city, accommodating them in great palaces and treating them with the reverence reserved for the most important guests. When Cortes arrived in Mexico in 1519, the Mexicans thought that Quetzalcoatl was coming back to claim his seat. He had left Tula on a year one read, which was exactly the same date when Cortes arrived in the Gulf Coast of Mexico in 1519. The natives were familiar with this myth of Quetzalcoatl, a bearded man who was coming back. When he arrived, he found some Spaniards who were familiar with this myth. And in fact, he was helped by Spaniards to conquer Mexico. He was also very much aware of the fact that the natives weren't familiar with horses. So he scared the population with horses, with gunpowder. The Mexicans weren't familiar with these particular fire weapons, and they were petrified. Relationships were soon to sour when the Spaniards' true intentions of seizing gold became apparent. Cortes had shocked the watching Aztecs when he ordered his troops to throw figures representing gods down the steps of the great temple. Moctezuma, perhaps convinced by the omens of evil, believed that the newcomers would be triumphant and was soon taken prisoner. Moctezuma himself 
in a way, defeated his own people because he was a prisoner of his own beliefs. He realized that the Europeans were human beings, but he was still stubborn, thinking that perhaps it was Quetzalcoatl. The Mexicans were upset about the fact that he was still fighting with the idea, and it was his own people who actually killed him. It, there is one description in which he comes out his balcony and he's stoned by his own people. The formal attack on the capital of the Aztec Empire began on April 28, 1521. And for the desperate Aztec defenders, there could never be any real match against the attacking army. With more than 900 Spaniards, thousands of Indian allies, 86 horses, 15 cannons, and 13 ships, the once great city soon fell, and the mighty empire soon crumbled. For the few survivors who remained, any hopes of retaliation were destroyed when European diseases, such as cholera and smallpox, against which they had no resilience, took hold. And the once bursting population of the city became a subdued, dwindling few. The conquest was successful also because they had fire weapons, they had horses, and they knew the tactics of war. The Indians were not playing a war. They were not familiar with the kind of war the Spaniards were familiar with. The ancient Mexicans were used to conquer and find people to sacrifice to their gods, but they weren't used to just kill people for the sake of killing people. They had two different and opposing ideas as to what war was. This marked the end of the Tenochtitlan and the beginning of New Spain. Fortunately, the language is still spoken in certain parts of Mexico. The vocabulary has not all gone. In fact, Nahuatl words have been blended with the Spanish, and the influence of the Aztecs continues today. Mexican Spanish is sprinkled with words of Nahuatl origin, some of which, especially those for foods, tomato, chili, chocolate, have entered English and other languages as well. Aztec life is far from dead. It's still alive. The language is spoken, Nahuatl is spoken in several modern states of Mexico. The clothing in several states is still very much the same, long skirts, a belt holding the skirt, triangular item called keshkemetl over the shoulders, which was worn without a blouse in pre-Hispanic times, but nowadays is worn with a blouse. The male have changed their clothing, but the female are still keeping ancient traditions in certain villages in Mexico. The food is very much still pre-Columbian. We can trace recipes such as mole, the chicken cooked in chocolate sauce and chilies, that is still part of the Mexican tradition. Tortillas are eaten every day. And the way of life in certain villages is still pre-Columbian in orientation. There are certain rituals which were carried out in Aztec times, such as beheading quail and dropping the blood onto the earth to feed the earth. That's still being carried out in the state of Puebla, particularly in San Pablito. So there are many rituals which still are kept. The use of the hummingbird as a charm object is still carried out. Aztec dance is thriving. 
keeping alive the traditions of yesteryear. The great temple today lies in ruins, but remains a reminder to the times when it represented one of the greatest powers on Earth. As the Aztec poem has it, for as long as the world endures, the power and glory of Tenochtitlan will survive.